today's mini symposium on responsible data science and AI. Yeah, okay. Can you guys hear me in the back? Okay, so yeah, so welcome everyone. Um, so uh, my name is Xing Liu. I'm the managing director of Michigan Institute for Data Science or MIDAS. So I want to just tell you guys a little bit about who we are. As you can see on this slide, uh, we are the focal point of data science and AI research here on campus. And uh, we have about 450-ish uh, faculty affili affiliates coming from all the schools and colleges. So by that number, we are the largest data science institute at a US u university and one of the most scientifically diverse. So our goals really are to enhance the scientific and the societal impact of data science and AI research. So um, currently we have a few focus areas um, for our research support and others uh, related activities. And as you can see, the first one is responsible data science and AI, which is really the theme of today's event. And um, so when we talk about responsible data science and AI, there really are a few things. One is, what is, what is it? You know, when people talk so much about equity, fairness, representativeness, really, what do they mean? That's one question. And then as data scientists and AI researchers, how, what, what do we do about them, right? <laughs> so developing tools and solutions, and then enabling the adoption of such solutions uh, in collaboration with uh, other organizations and uh, researchers. So that's kind of what we're trying to do with this focus area. So, um, let's see. So today's mini symposium is part of the um, Future Leaders Summit. And in a second, I'll tell you about, about this. But the goal of today's mini symposium is really to explore some of the conceptual and technical uh, contents of responsible data science and AI, and also bring together people who have similar um, interest or passion so that we can build collaboration from now on. So as I just told you, this is part of the Future Leaders Summit. Um, and uh, this is an annual event that we've been organizing since 2019. And each year we invite um, 30 to 40-ish um, advanced graduate students and postdocs from around the country to come to Ann Arbor um, so that, so, so as to provide a platform for them to um, exchange research ideas, receive career mentoring, and build collaboration. Okay, so, yeah. So this is today's, um, first, so I want to start talking, uh, giving you a little bit of idea of, uh, oh, actually, you know what, this is, this is for tomorrow. I just want to mention it to you guys. Um, tomorrow in the afternoon, there is the Zoom session that you're all welcome to attend, and that's the uh, public-private partnership uh, roundtable discussion around the same theme. Okay. Okay. Then I'm going to introduce today's uh, speakers. Um, so I will not read through all their achievements because every one of them has many. So I was thinking maybe I'll just say a couple things about each of them. Okay, so the first speaker today is Dr. H.V. Jagadish, the director of MIDAS, and Bernard A. Goller, co collegiate professor of electrical engineering and computer science here at University of Michigan. The two things about Jag I wanna say, uh, one is he's one of the first computer scientists who put ethical issues front and center in data science and AI research, and he developed the first data science ethics MOOC in the US and he collaborates with data science organizations to promote data science ethics. And number two, his research also has a focus on developing data equity systems that center around issues of um, representation, diversity, fairness, transparency, and validity. Second speaker today is David Mangjo, who is the founding director and professor of practice of the School of Data Science at the University of Texas, San Antonio. So the two things I wanna say about David, one is that he is truly a builder of data science organizations. 
he was one of the key people who built the Data Science Institute at Ohio State University. Then he played a major role setting the strate strategic direction of the UC Berkeley Institute for Data Science. And now he's building the very first data science school at a minority serving institution. So, yeah, so number two is before his career in academia, David was a research leader in industry for decades, focusing on data and cyber before these things are everywhere. So he is truly a pioneer in data science. Third speaker uh, today, we have Shashi Shikar. McKnight Distinguished University a Professor, University Professor of Computer Science at the University of Minnesota. The two things um, that I want to mention that he did have been benefiting, I think, everyone in this room. Okay, number one, so he developed roadmap storage and, and routing methods that transform the navigation system and made things such as G GPS and Google Maps possible. And number two, his evacuation route planning algorithms have been used by uh, Homeland Security. Then after this, we'll have a short break. Then we'll have um, the next speaker is going to be Michael Wellman, Richard H. Orenstein Division Chair, Lynn A. Conway Collegiate Professor of Computer Science and Engineering here at the University of Michigan. So two things about Mike, one is that he's widely known for his computational market research, game theory and applications in finance and marketing, e-commerce and related cybersecurity. And so, but before switching to computational market research, Mike was actually a researcher in the US Air Force and was in active duty. Um, he was a Air Force captain. And number two, uh, Mike is the only person on today's panel speakers who was also a faculty mentor for last year's uh, Future Leaders Summit. So we're really grateful for him to do this. And then our last speaker is uh, Frauke Kreuter, co-director of the Social Data Science Center and professor in the joint program in survey methodology at the University of Maryland, uh, and also professor of statistics and data science at Ludwig Maximilian University of Munich. So two things about Frauke. One is she is the co-founder of the Courage Initiative, which develops technical solutions and training to help governments use data in ethical and responsible ways. And number two, as a prominent survey researcher, Frauke also founded the International Program for Survey and Data Science. So after the talks, all the, um, all the speakers will have a panel discussion about the future of research the, around the theme of responsible data science and AI. So with that, I'm going to welcome our first speaker. Thank you, Jing, and thank you, all of you. I uh, want to just uh, begin at a fairly high level talking about how we have traditionally viewed the collaborative work that humans do with computing. So the, there's, a, there's a lot of, uh, there has been a lot of talk about human in the loop computing. And usually what people mean by that, um, and I'm a computer scientist, by the way, uh, as are, I guess, some of you in this room, uh, is that Humans work collaboratively with computers to solve problems. And, and the typical question is, how can I more effectively use a computer? Right? And so the loop looks, uh, as I show in this figure, uh, the human is trying to do some analysis or some exploration of some sort. There are some algorithms that run that crunch big data on the computers. And those things provide some results and some suggestions well, what you want eventually are insights, but, but you sort of get help from the computer in terms of refining your question and getting better answers. Okay, so that's human in the loop. The thing that happens uh, with the way big data is used today is that 
almost everything that we say and do gets sucked into a digital exhaust. And that is basically what constitutes big data. And so the loop that I showed you before uh, just has the labels switched a bit. And so now what humans are supplying with computers uh, are the contents of this digital exhaust. And what we're getting from the computers are impacts on humans. And this is still a human in the loop, but the agency is not that of the human. And I think that that's, that's really the big shift. So in the original version of this figure, the task at hand was something that the human wanted to do. And the computer was a helper. Here, the agency belongs to whoever had programmed the computer, and that is not the human in the loop. That is some other human outside the loop, presumably working for some big company, right? Um, and what happens with this is um, you get effects of this in terms of decisions that get made uh, that have uh, an impact on the humans in the loop. And initially, these systems were driven by relatively benign, profit-motivated things, better targeted advertising, promotions that might make you want to buy more from a particular vendor, you know, things of this nature. But increasingly, these things are being in, in used for the same sorts of things, get used for all sorts of things, uh, such as employment and sentencing criminals and qualifying for loans. It's also used for things like resource allocation or things that are not individual but, but may impact large segments of society. And you know, many of you spoke about that this morning and, and uh, I'm sure we'll hear more about it in, in the next uh, day and a half. <coughs> The question is, what do we do about something like this? And I want to start by talking about non-technical things first, uh, and actually probably for the bulk of what I'm talking about. I, and I think that there are lots of benefits that can be derived from big data and data science and AI. There are many places where one has got significant efficiencies and significant insights and significant benefits to society. Um, I also think that it isn't a reasonable assumption to begin by assuming that corporations are evil because they're not. Okay, they're a cornerstone of the capitalist society that we live in and that's, that's fundamental to our, you know, our life and our prosperity. So I want to begin by giving you examples of how things work where there's a cooperative thing that gets these systems set up in ways that we want societally. And here's my exhibit number one. If you think about video cameras in stores, okay, most large retailers will have video cameras. And these video cameras are there for security reasons, okay, because they want to avoid shoplifting. That's a primary reason anyway, there are others, but, but that's, that's a primary reason to do that. And we have an overall societal consensus that it is fine for retailers to have video cameras in stores and to watch us go about our business shopping, okay? Um, but there are limits on, in this sort of unwritten, unspoken societal consensus, and the limits are things like 
you may videotape us, but you may not put these videotapes up on the web. Okay, and so they don't. Another is you may videotape me shopping in the store, but you may not videotape me changing in a fitting room. Okay, and so they don't, even though fitting rooms for clothing stores are a major point of shoplifting. The stores can give you numbers on, on what fraction of the shoplifting they think happens in their fitting rooms, but they expect it to be sufficiently socially objectionable that they won't do this, right? Because they want the goodwill of customers, and so they're going to do the right thing. Okay? So where I'm going with this is, when we look at pictures like this, and I hear people saying, oh, bait back companies, you know, look what they do to us. My answer always is, do we know what it is that's okay to do? Do we have a societal consensus on what's okay and what's not okay? And if we do, then you can bet that everybody, every upstanding company is going to abide by that consensus. If there isn't a consensus, and when there's new technology, often there isn't a consensus, then, you know, all bets are off, okay? And are there things that some companies have done that we feel upset about? Yes, okay? But that, that's sort of part of, you know, growing pains. It, it, it doesn't mean that this is, this is how the world is going to be in the future with everything that we accomplish with data science and AI, okay? And so, <laughs> this is, to me, a, um, a definition of ethics, okay? So those of you who sort of have an understanding of philosophy you know that there are many ways that you can approach ethics. Um, what I'm going to present in the next couple of slides is a utilitarian view. So this is not a view based on morality or justice or uh, any, of any, any religious grounding, right? This is a purely utilitarian view. And my point is we have ethics in the form of shared values that we all choose to live by. And what that means is that we voluntarily choose to do things, choose to follow rules, even if nobody is enforcing them. Or even if the enforcement is sort of distributed and vague and, oops. Um, even if the enforcement is through things like, you know, societal disapproval. It's not regulation, it's not fines, it's not prison, you know, it's, it's, it's none of those. It's just, you know, I'm not gonna put a camera in my fitting room because it would annoy my customers. Okay, that's, that's as, as a matter of a utilitarian thing, you know, if this is, you know, if I, if I give you my word that I won't reveal a secret that you tell me, Okay, I'm not going to, even though that's not a punishable offense. I mean, the, it's, it's just something that would, would be embarrassing, would be shameful, would, you know, I'd suffer your annoyance. You know, the disincentives are potentially low level, but they're sufficient for most of us to abide by rules that, that society has. So um, these sorts of utilitarian things that we do um, are 
don't require for us to get benefits, it doesn't require that everybody follow them. Okay? So another example I have of this uh, that, that's uh, utilitarian ethics is littering. Okay? We wouldn't, you know, if I eat something, I'm not going to drop the wrapper on the floor. I'm going to pick it up and put it in the trash bin. It's a small amount of extra effort that I'm putting in, but it's, it is some effort. It's non-zero. For me, that small amount of extra effort is worth it because it is part of the social contract that I'll do it and you'll do it and everybody will do it and we'll all have the benefit of not having trash on the floor. Right? To get that benefit, it isn't necessary that 100% of the people not do it. If there's an occasional person dropping litter on the floor, we deal with it. You know, we might punish them, we might, you know, whatever, to, to try to reduce the number of such people. And we pick up the trash when we find it on the ground and, and, and put it away. Okay? So um, here's a, a technical development where ethical principles, I think, have uh, really worked. And that has to do with spam. So when the internet was young, there were these two lawyers in Arizona who figured out that they could send unsolicited advertising to their potential customers um, via this new medium. And they found that it was a very effective way of generating new business. Other people heard about their success to the extent that in spite of their having found this way of growing their law business, found that it was even more worthwhile for them to drop their law business and set themselves up as marketing consultants. Right? And this notion of unsolicited advertising started. And so this was the early days of spam when this was technological innovation. Very soon, this got to a point where this was not acceptable. Right? The, the, the load that was being imposed in terms of messages we didn't want to see was, was just too much. And there was a popular outcry. And unsolicited messages got from being a cool technological innovation to something that was really a nasty thing. Once we had societal consensus that this was not okay, other things have followed. Right? So there is regulation. There are laws about what companies can do. So in the US, for instance, there is a thing that requires that if somebody is sending you a commercial message, they must have an unsubscribe button and they must identify themselves and say who they are. And every upstanding company that sends you email will do that. Okay? Does that mean there aren't other non-upstanding companies? Yes, there are. But we all live with relatively functioning email systems and relatively functioning other messaging systems with some level of spam, which is more at the level of minor annoyance than a showstopper. Okay? And that, to me, is, again, a success because of societal consensus. And so my takeaway from all of this is to say, on all of the issues that uh, we worry about, and rightly so, with respect to fairness and bias and equity and, and so on, with respect to data science and how algorithmic decisions affect us. We need to talk about it, not just amongst ourselves as a data science community, but with 
everybody. There needs to be a societal consensus that draws bright lines on what's okay to do and what's not okay to do. And once we know what's not okay to do, it's not gonna happen. Or it's gonna happen in a very limited way that, that's manageable. And right now, I believe that that kind of thing, broad societal discussion is happening with respect to uh, facial recognition. Okay, we are not at a point of societal consensus as on that, but we are at a point of very active societal discussion. And I expect that as a, as a society, we'll come to some, some consensus on this within the next years. And that'll tell us what kind of facial recognition is okay and what's not okay. With respect to a lot of the other stuff that's going on with data science, I don't think we have even that conversation really going outside of communities such as this. And so we really need to broaden that engagement to, to get there. Okay. <clears throat> so with that kind of as background, I wanna talk for a few minutes about uh, data equity. So, <clears throat> first, want to distinguish equity from fairness. Fairness there is something that um, you might define as treating an individual without prejudice, but this is really hard to define, uh, even to measure. Um, there are just too many correlated things. You can't take one aspect you know, race or gender or whatever aspect you're, you're worried about and isolate it uh, with everything else not affected. There's so many other things that correlates. Um, so a much easier thing to measure are group outcomes. Okay, now you're not looking at individuals, you're looking at groups and that has all kinds of issues in terms of you're not possibly uh, dealing with exactly the same things, um, but that at least is, is easy to measure, and so that's why a lot of regulation uh, and, and a lot of attempts by people to try to increase uh, diversity, for instance, or whatever, is looking at group outcomes rather than individual things. Whatever be your notion of fairness, um, that's another thing where it's really in the eye of the beholder. Um, and whatever we want to achieve in terms of fairness, we're gonna require social consensus for the reasons that I was talking about a few minutes ago. And this is an application scenario by application scenario thing. Um, once we have that societal consensus, we can expect things will, that algorithms, we can, we can just plug that in as a constraint on whatever algorithm we're building, it'll happen. So to me, sort of a lot of the work that people are doing with respect to fairness in sort of algorithmic decision making is sort of saying, well, the day that there is societal consensus, I'll have the technology to deliver, okay? But um, I don't think that societal consensus is coming anytime soon. <clears throat> Some of the things that we have been talking about are things like, you know, we worry about is a training data set representative um, of the population. Um, you know, our observed correlations due to compounding processes. There are all these kinds of things that one worries about. One thing that people often forget about uh, machine learning in general is that training data by definition is from the past. The application of this data is in the future. 
of the models that you learn from the training data. And so a an unstated assumption that underlies the entire field is that the future will be like the past. And that is a reasonable assumption if you're operating in an appropriate time scale. Now, if you're training a pattern recognition thing, sure. If this looked like a four, five minutes ago, it looks like a four now. No problem. But if you're going to use machine learning for things like, you know, employment or admissions or anything where you expect outcomes over multi-year periods, I think that the entire basis of using this is fundamentally flawed. And I'm just surprised that there's so many companies out there trying to sell resume sifting algorithms. It, it's just it's just not based on a sound principle. In terms of not unfairly beating up on algorithms, I'd like to point out that humans are a bundle of biases too. And so, you know, there's no human that you'd say is perfectly fair. And we are all very, very smart at coming up with post hoc explanations for things that we did uh, or judgments that we made, even though those might have been sort of intuitive gut feel, you know, this neuron just fired because that's how, you know, some something was in my subconscious. Right. Um, so with algorithms, you can measure bias. You can simulate the heck out of it. You can run millions of examples. You can see exactly the ways in which things are going to go bad. And so uh, I think that with the kind of work that many of you are doing, there's there are hopes, there's a hope that we might be able to get somewhere. So I want to talk about a couple of concepts that are different from fairness. Uh, they're related, but they're different. So fairness doesn't necessarily lead to diversity. Diversity is a potential desirable goal in and of itself. Um, and in the in the algorithms business, diversity has been known, for instance, for some things like information retrieval for decades. Right? So if you do a search, like let's say you do a Google search, you don't want the 10 very similar things as the top 10 results. Every good search engine is going to diversify results. But start with what they think is the top match to what you queried, but then they'll overweight things that are quite different from it that also scored not too badly. Right? So there are reasons to do this, and there are mechanisms to do this. Um, but this is hard to do because you're, it's a group construct. You're measuring diversity of a set of results, and you're making decisions about individual items in terms of much of what you do. In the IR context, potentially you're doing a group decision, but let's say you're doing a hiring situation, you're looking at individuals, and you're making individual decisions. Um, and, and it's just not, not easy to, mathematically these things are hard to set up if you want to do this algorithm thing. Okay, so I want to talk about equity as a concept that's different from fairness. Um, the, the point of fairness uh, is to say that we want to treat everybody fair.
fairly, whatever fair means, and fair is often taken to mean equally. What we want um, with equity is to treat people differently as needed based on their individual circumstances. Okay. This cartoon, uh, which is in the public domain, um, explains this concept very nicely. So on the left is equality, on the right is equity in terms of distribution of resources, which is the three boxes to stand on just to begin. So um, how does this work? Okay, we have these notions of equity in our value systems. Okay, they might be expressed slightly differently. We might draw lines at different places and have reasonable disagreements. Okay, but these notions, the basic ideas are, I think, universal. So if one looks at uh, things like how many dollars per student do you have in the budget in a public school, it's usually an aggregate budget allocation. Okay, it's the same per student. But if you decide that there are children with special needs and they need special resources, and there has to be money taken out of that common budget to do that. And if that means that your average class size goes up because you can hire fewer regular teachers because you now have some special needs teachers. Every school district goes through this kind of balancing act. Okay? We can disagree on how many special needs teachers there should be and how much attention we should be paid. And there are, and those are legitimate arguments to have. But the concept, I think, is universal. A thing that we as educators do all the time, in fairness, every student gets the same amount of time on an exam. But there is an equity consideration where we say there are some students who have special needs because of medical conditions, et cetera. And there's a system and process through which students can apply to get additional time on exams. And there are students who get extra time on exams. And that is part of equity, even though it is not equal. So how does this affect data science? When we talk about representation in a data set, we are often worried about, do we have enough proportional representation? Okay. So we may worry, for instance, that because of historical biases, that some group might be underrepresented in a data set. Okay. Um, and that's a valid thing to worry about. And, and is indeed a significant concern in many situations. However, if you have a small minority, even if the small minority is represented proportionately to its size in the population, in the data set, that may not be sufficient for the model to take any special characteristics of this minority into account. A pure error minimizing objective function is going to result in potentially ignoring this minority. And so equity requires that we overrepresent under small minorities in our training data sets because without doing so, they will not have enough impact on the learned model for the model to do well on them. Um, okay, I was gonna talk to you about um, 
many aspects of data equity, um, and I'm gonna breeze through that in the next minute or so. We already talked about representation equity, uh, which is, do we have enough roles? There's feature equity, which is, do we record the right attributes? Um, often we find that we don't have in the data record the attributes that we care about or that are important for some reason. Um, there's, there's a question of who has access to data results. And uh, there's outcome equity in terms of unintended consequences. And the spam is an example of, you know, we don't always think through or uh, we don't have the ability sometimes even to imagine what might happen from something. And we just need to be able to deal with it when it happens. Um, having the having processes to question results is something that's critical where we have outcomes from automated decision making systems that can have real world impacts and we have those in place for some old time things so if you have a, a wrong entry in your credit report there is a process to question it and have it corrected. It's a painful process, but it's there, okay? And these processes are necessarily adversarial and it's probably will continue to be painful. But if somebody is making a decision on whether to give you a loan or whether to give you a job or something based on what you have in social media, you better know what it is and you better have a method of recourse. Uh, and without that, I think it's not appropriate. Um, in terms of where one addresses this, this is sort of the newspaper headline version of it or the company uh, playbook version of it. This is what a bunch of us uh, wrote uh, about a decade ago. And the point I wanna make is something that, there was a paper that one of you mentioned this morning about Everybody wants to work on the model and nobody wants to work on the data. Um, and and uh, this is, there's a large data ecosystem and we have to worry about bias and fairness uh, and equity and errors in every aspect of, of this. So there, there are rich problems to address in boxes other than that fourth box. And I'm gonna skip through uh, a whole bunch of these things so that I keep us uh, on time. Um, Jing mentioned uh, my MOOC, uh, which came out on um, edX five years ago, uh, is now on Coursera and FutureLearn. And individual case studies in this are, individual videos are uh, licensed with a Creative Commons license. So you're free to incorporate a short video that's relevant to whatever it is that, that you want to use in your teaching in the future or whatever. Um, so um, I'm gonna just conclude by saying it's not okay for a data scientist to divorce themselves from impact. What we do has impact on the world uh, as people who create technologies, which many of you are, um, I certainly am, you gotta recognize that there are many things we don't know. You know, I know what I know. Um, but if one looks at the impact of the kinds of things that we create, um, other people may, who have expertise in other things uh, don't understand how our algorithms work. And, and so there's a question of um, nobody really having that full depth of knowledge and we definitely need to be in the conversation to be able to address this. And with that, I think I'm gonna stop. And um, I don't think we're gonna do questions. Um, and so I'm gonna call up David Monjo for his presentation.
thank you, um, Jai, for what you presented, and thank you, everybody, for the opportunity to um, speak to you today. I, the, in keeping with the theme of the program, I have the title that you see here, but I'm at, there are actually two topics that I would like to discuss today that I think are relevant particularly to those participating in the summit who are thinking about uh, whether you pursue positions in the academic job market or in the private sector or, or in government. And that would be going to uh, the first topic I'd like to talk about is the school that Jing mentioned when she uh, introduced me, which is the new School of Data Science at the University of Texas at San Antonio, which is the first school at a minority serving institute. And so I wanted to say a bit about that because it directly relates to the topic of data science that is equitable, informed, and secure. And it also offers one model that perhaps later when we have the uh, sessions on applications and interviewing, it may point out some things that you're, if you decide to stay in academic career pursuits, you may want to be asking questions about the units that you're looking at, how they're organized, how they're structured. Because right now, there are four universities that have set up new academic units as schools. There's University of Virginia, and we've heard from some of the participants in that school today. There's the University of North Carolina at both the Charlotte and the Chapel Hill campus, and there's UTSA. And then there's one university that has announced a college, and that's UC Berkeley. All of them. So you have three places calling themselves schools of data science. None of them are structured in the same way, which is very important for you to uh, ask about in your interviewing because it affects uh, tenure, it affects promotion, it affects your funding. So um, that's why I wanted to talk, talk a bit about this, this school. So I'm talking about it from two standpoints. One, it relates to the, the topic, and two, it, um, I'm hoping it will give you some, raise some questions for you that you wanna pursue in your interviewing as it comes forward. Okay, so this is a, a this is a photo of the new building that's being built uh, deliberately in downtown San Antonio for the School of Data Science, and um, th this was an interesting decision. The university itself, I was telling some folks at lunch, was it's only 51 years old, and it was built on the Beltway around this city, so many local folks joke and call it the University of Texas near San Antonio um, because they the city felt like, well, the university system's talking a good game, but how, how committed are they to the urban core? So following the, uh, that in around the 80s, they built a downtown campus, but they haven't expanded it over the years. And now with a new president and a new provost in the past several years, there's this very deliberate decision to extend the campus, building out these new academic areas like data science at the city core to improve access to the people who live in the city, who are predominantly, um, San Antonio is a majority minority city, no, minority majority, I never get it right. Um, and it, so the, the intent was to build this school in the neighborhoods that are primarily Hispanic, Latino, and black. So part of what we're, we're trying um, to do here is really think about inspiring from among the citizens of the area, but also attracting people to a school that was one time a commuter school, but in this last year has achieved R1 status. So that, in 50 years, that's, that's not bad. Um, and they have, you know, there's a lot of uh, desire here to ascend and create greater opportunity 
for the student body, and I'll talk a bit about the demographic of that student body in a minute. But part of what I think about, um, Jen also mentioned I come from the private sector, and so I was there, you know, more than two times the amount of time I've been in higher ed, and I'm always thinking about, well, what's our competitive advantage? What's our differentiator? Because even though there may only be this handful of new academic units at universities, we know with Midas and many other, most, you know, there are at least 40 to 50 universities that have stood up major research units that are committed to data science, AI, analytics. So I think about, well, how do we make ourselves at UTSA uh, unique somehow? And part of that goes to this, this equitable and secure points that we'll get to. So you, w these, some of this you're gonna know, right? Why would a school like UTSA decide to build? Well, as recently as uh, last September in a letter to Congress there by a set of uh, group of senators, there was this, what you can read here on the screen um, saying, you know, we still, we've been talking about data science education and research for a while, but we're, we're still falling short. We're still not producing the number of students or scholars. And um, then we had to think about, well, why was this important in, in Texas and at our university? And you can see that the increase in demand um, in that region is outstripping the demand nationwide. So there's a good argument for why to focus on this simply from the demand aspect. Put aside equity and um, security and, and the other things I'll talk about. So I mentioned it, the school is among a, a few of its kind and interestingly, um, it started, the, the original conception of the school went to who plays in data science. And I think if we raised hands, we'd probably reveal here that computer science, math, statistics dominate, right? And they do form the foundation of data science. But their impact, and some of the speakers have mentioned this, and certainly in his concluding remarks, uh, Jag did, it's where's the uh, impact? And the impact often, as we know, comes from bringing in the application domains and thinking about the interdisciplinary methods and tools that apply across these areas. I was struck this morning, um, very often when we talk about data science, I hear interdisciplinary. I think only one speaker this morning brought this up. And that is, was it somewhat intriguing to me because I think we, maybe it's reflected in, you know, who's in the room, but we need to be thinking of the application space. And it, it, it struck uh, actually two speakers because one who gave a more theoretical presentation did then say, this matters because it can be applied in these fields. And I think we all need to be, be thinking about that. Oh no, it still has the animation left in it. I thought I got rid of that. <laughs> um, so the school, you can read the, the mission and, and goals here, but part of what is really unique, if you, look, if you look at Texas, right, and I've been there nine months, um, very, the headlines that the, uni, that the state earns are not flattering uh, because of some of the, the politics of the state. But if you look at what's happening in the state in terms of the population, and this will get to the area of equitable, it, it does in fact reflect what will be the majority population of the United States by, I think the number is 2045. And so you really, at this school, are th we're thinking about, well, how, if this is reflective, the people who live here are reflective of the future of the United States, and the data science economy or the digital economy offers so much opportunity for social mobility, for interesting work, how do we um, make sure that the future of America is being influenced by the future population of America, so the direction in our science and education. And I. The, the other thing I would just call attention to below is the values we've heard about, um, FAIR, but 
something else that I think is really remarkable about the world of data science is how much is being driven by the open source world, the open source software world. And that that's something that I think all of the schools and programs need to embrace and do even and more of because it's such a compelling place for academia to play, the, the sharing uh, of knowledge. So the school as we stand it up will have um, the degrees that are listed on this page. So as I said, for those who are thinking of pursuing academic careers and you interview with different schools or research institutes, you know, some of you will probably apply to universities where you're told uh, your job is being half funded by the Department of Math and half funded by the Data Science Institute. Um, and you, ne you need to get that. And in this case, these programs are being brought together from different colleges into the school, but the school, the, you know, the colleges still administer them. Um, again, I'm, I'm being wicked pragmatic tactical here, but you need to think about these things as you look at Eunice because it'll impact your teaching loads and your obligations to the institute versus to the department. And this is not uncommon. So what I'm showing at UTSA, this is going on at, at, at a lot of the schools. Maybe the most interesting point to note here in terms of the theme that we have for this conference is the makeup of the initial 400 students that will be part of this school. And you can see how many um, come from underrepresented groups or are, um, are women, and in particular, our first generation. That goes back to me to the exciting part about a school like this that is uh, bringing a, a different group of people to the table to partake in, in the digital economy. And, and I think it important that all, you know, th that universities that don't have that makeup, um, that we find ways to work, we work together. The leading uh, data and research areas for the school are listed here. And these are all driven, these areas are all driven by the growth sectors in the regional economy. So these three areas are, are driving uh, growth and opportunity in data science. Something else to point out in this um, chat is that so often, I think, and I, 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 you know, you could all prove me wrong, but I think that many of us, uh, many of you will be faced with the idea of, well, do I go to University X or um, Google contacted me or AWS is seeking me? What I think is less likely is that we don't think about the really interesting data science work in other sectors and particularly you know, I like something Jag said that uh, corporations are not not inherently evil. They are part of a capitalist society. Well, I think there's also sometimes a view that banking and finance is particularly evil. Um, but some of the most interesting research, say, in um, climate change is actually coming out of the finance industry because they're looking at the impact of climate on financial markets. So um, something else. <laughs> To, to think about as you're pursuing your your degree, your um, thinking about your careers. Then finally in the school, we, so we'll have about 30 faculty initially uh, who are core teaching there and 70 affiliates. And then we have a, a whole series of research labs, including a lab working with the city of San Antonio and another working with the UT health system. All right, so I wanted to lay that groundwork because I think it provides an, an example of some of the uh, academic unit, academic enterprises that you may be seeking careers in. And it also is very relevant to what I said about we, how to aim, now that we have this school, how do we aim for data science that is equitable and informed and secure? And it's relevant, which I also mentioned, I think in a, in a state like um, Texas, it may not be the exemplar for 
the, the, I think, probably fairly widely shared support of diversity, equity, and inclusion in, in the workforce and in, in the United States. And so we think about that in, in the area we're in in San Antonio, which has been for a long time, historic, historically, it has been um, a crossroads for many, many indigenous groups of course, the, the Spanish, and it's, um, but there's a very interesting history there, particularly those of us in the, who grew up in the Northeast, as I did, I don't think we appreciate the rich history in, of that part of the country, and also that the relationship between the indigenous groups and the European was very different than with the British and the French. So uh, something else you might want to study at, at some time but it, it plays, why it's so intriguing to me is again, you juxtapose this drive to an incredibly diverse population with this uh, not so diverse uh, political vibe. We have talked about transparency and algorithms, algorithmic fairness. I think we've talked less about, when we think, think of words like equitable, who? And that's really part of the focus that I think, if we want data science to be equitable and to uh, consider the kinds of things, the, the different measures of equity and fairness and transparency that have, that have been brought up, we really need to be thinking about who is at the table. Something else I would encourage people to do when you're interviewing and looking at jobs is to be looking at who would you be teaching with? How many of the people in the department um, are different than you. And I believe that that could weigh into and enrich um, how successful you're, you are in integrating into the organization. So it's not just who learns, which I'm trying to show on the um, left side of the chat, but also who teaches and the university I'm at has been very intentional about who we're hiring to teach so that among now the Carnegie R1 HSIs, you know, it's, as it says, we have the second highest number of faculty that are representing representative of the student body. So that's the, the who to me about equitable data science is, is very um, important. And the how, the another part of equitable data science is how do we improve access? So we've heard today, and I think almost at every data science uh, conference and event that I'm at, um, hear a lot about, well, the whole notion of data science for social good, right? Th these are common. There are conferences, there are workshops. One of the things that we've need, we've need to, think about at UTSA is, is that you don't have an instance of a school and a group of really well-intentioned data scientists, computer scientists, statisticians, mathematicians, and the others come set up this school and say, look, we're here, we have great opportunities for you. Well, we're coming into a city that already has a history of not trusting the university. So a lot of what we're thinking about to um, build, go backwards into the pipeline is not that we will set up uh, training opportunities or workshops, but we'll set up relationships with the organizations that are noted here. Prosper West and the Westside Community Center are trusted players in the Latino and Hispanic community, and the Good Hood is a trusted player in the primarily black community. So the idea here is if you really want to open up the world and say there's great, great interesting challenges for you in data science, we're trying to say, we're trying to find people that will say, hey, um, you should go over to the school tonight and listen to this lecture, or you should go see the, um, the dance exhibit that they're capturing video images of all this dance, and you'll see this cool way how they translate it and they using, um, image analysis, they, the, the scientists are able to advise the dancers about how they might be damaging their joints and stuff, right? So trying to make it real, but we're saying we, we won't necessarily do the invitation. 
We're seeking others who are already trusted to do the invitation. And I think that's another, uh, that's an important part of what I mean when I'm talking about data science, it is equitable. Not only who's participating, but who can actually improve access. And our universities are not always the right first person to try and improve that access. And the third aspect of um, data science that I, that I think about when I think it's equitable is let's not limit what we think students are capable of, depending on the university you end up at, or it, if you stay in higher ed. Um, I have, based on the demand that we've seen, and you know, I think that the US Department of Labor is projecting 28% growth in data science positions through 2026. Um, and the, you know, this, the median starting salary according to um, Forbes, I think it was, is 113, but there was just an article that came out yesterday by Fortune, I think, that gives even higher numbers talking about the, you know, um, it's anywhere from 115 to 300 depending on your level of degree. So there, there's this push from industry and there's a, these big dollars being thrown at folks. But I think what I've seen at, at UTSA as a Hispanic serving institute and the population that we serve, we have to respect the fact that some of those students, some of our students simply are trying to get the bachelors, get a local company to hire them and, and we don't have trouble placing the students. But they haven't thought beyond that. So I think part of the role of the, the department, the, the faculty and the institutes that are all about data science is respecting that, but also saying, hey, if you ever change your mind, if your family situation changes, um, there are these other opportunities if you went on and got a master's. And did you know you can actually make an interesting career in higher ed? Here's how you would do it. Um, and that's why I, I do, I've been challenging at my own university that we have to just stop saying, you know, our data, we're all about workforce development, workforce development. Well, there are some students that maybe want to be engaged in knowledge development, and we need to create, help create the pathways for the, those students as well. So I love, everybody's familiar with past year's quadrants um, and the, what is it, data inspired research up in the corner. Well, there, if you haven't seen it, there's a great paper by Boyer. He takes that whole concept forward and talks about different forms of scholarship, the, the highly recognized as scholarship of discovery, but he argues for the importance of the scholarship of application. It's a, it's a good read. So I think our, as we look at our students, um, we need to be thinking about, yes, the scale, get as many students into this wonderful field as possible, but we also need to be thinking about are we giving them opportunity to expand their, their scholarship. Oh, sorry about that. All right, then informed. This, um, I actually wrote a note. Sorry, I haven't remembered everybody's names here yet, but it struck me when Mariah spoke. Um, I think there was a mention of the one credit hour course, yeah. And that really struck me because I was going to talk about this. If we're talking about our curriculum and our research being informed, again, it goes back to you know, what, we, what we learn and teach. The courses listed on the left come from some of the universities in this room. And it's like we have to throw in a course elective related to ethics. Um, and, but it's ri the, this whole concept that that Jag talked about and so on, we, we are, as Mariah pointed out, limiting this to sort of, it's this thing, it reminded me of, of people who get an MBA and the course that everybody enjoys the most because everybody gets an A is organizational design. It's not macro, fi it's not finance, it's not macroeconomics, all the hard stuff, but everybody loves that course. Well, data ethics, the stakes are a little bit higher, right? So to me, it can't be relegated to an elective we have to be thinking about how do we integrate it across the curriculum so that in every course it's coming up. And again, 
at, at dinner or break, if you're saying, no, at our university, it's totally integrated, that's great. Others need to learn that and share, share that with others, that model, because from my vantage point, it's not well integrated. It's a, it's a side topic. And then back to the idea that there were only a few mentions today about interdisciplinary. Um, before, before I, w oh, well, um, Jing mentioned this, so I've been at three universities and at the last university I was at, I, something else struck me that I think we need to think about in terms of informed, just like we're saying who reaches back in the pipeline and I don't think it's necessarily the data science faculty, the data science institutes, the computer science department it rely on others who are already established trust. Who teaches data science, critical thinking, ethics? I think we need to think more broadly. And this to me is a wonderful example. The Sense, Sensibility and Science course at UC Berkeley. And um, Saul Perlmutter and was the faculty director and I was the executive director of the Berkeley Institute for Data Science. And I, um, what you, I audited his course So um, when I was there. And what I love about this is who's talking about these issues of uh, values, as we heard from Jag and fears. And it's a physicist, a philosopher, and a psychologist. Um, I, so we really need to be thinking about who is in the conversation uh, of ethics. And it may not always be, the data ethics may not always be the most data savvy people now. I'm not saying that about my old boss, Saul Perlmutter, he's very data savvy. <laughs> in fact, he says his entire career around uh, astronomy and um, uh, was, was driven by uh, appreciation for data and having to deal with large data sets long before many of us were thinking about them. I also love the name of the course. I love the nod to the humanities, um, which, are, which are sometimes overlooked. And then the last part, I think, and when I'm thinking about data science that is informed, I and we, we I asked a question at lunch about how many people um, think that there was a you know more negative impact for not doing events in person like this and doing them virtually. And I think I can say there was over 50% of the people at the table agreed with what I think is you just cannot achieve an under. Um, a relationship, and now I, I don't want to put words in the folks' mouth, I'm going to go the next step. I don't think you can achieve the understanding of the nuances of things like critical thinking and data ethics if you're not connected. So the, it, the article that I mentioned in Fortune yesterday was actually citing the best online master's data science programs. Well, I'm, I would argue that you cannot learn really impactful critical thinking, impact, I, I understanding context and ethical issues, looking at a computer screen um, and asynchronously. It's not part of a group experience. I think that group experience is part of what opens us up to understanding how informed we are. The other thing about relying on the online is we one of the speakers today talked about people who are left out, the disabled, um, those living in rural communities and the elderly. Same thing here, we all have technology disparities. So we're saying, hey, we as universities, we're serving the public because we have an online degree. Well, which public are you serving? Um, so I think that's something for us to think about too. And then the, the final um, aspect I wanted to mention for the kind of data science that I think we need to practice and I'm trying to make at the core of the School of Data Science at UTSA is secure data science. So I don't think anyone today has talked about um, cybersecurity, um, issues of not, uh, you know, network penetration and so on. But one of the things we need to think about is all these wonderful algorithms, all this maybe these improved data collection methods that we come up with, anything that's based on a digital platform can be taken out in a second, right? So 
if we're developing data science solutions to help um, transplant patients stay in touch with their doctors and monitor what's going on with their newly transplanted organ, that is a wonderful contribution of data science. But it's one that's become rendered worthless in no time. And this is increasingly important, as we know right now, with all the, the cyber going on. So I think a challenge to all of us in, in our programs is much like ethics. I don't think ethics is broadly integrated into the data science curriculum and research agenda. I also don't think that we have enough attention to um, the hardware end. I mean, a lot of the glory in data science is in the software side. <laughs> um, I don't know if we're spending as much attention as we need on the hardware end, so we're always thinking about our work. How do we secure it? How do we prevent this uh, data from being corrupted? How do we prevent this algorithm from being messed with? Um, so that's another part of the data science I would, I'm arguing for and would like to see us, see us practice. And that's it. Um, so I'm going to um, take a sort of um, a, a slightly different angle and, and a, in some sense a broad angle in terms of lots of different societal applications, but also from data science or AI perspective, highlight another blind spot, you know, like uh, we were saying which topics are not covered and so on. So here you're going to see a very, a topic which I think is very important. And you can kind of see uh, my background is sort of with spatial data, you know, some of the books and so on. So most recently, this book from MIT Press is written for a very broad audience, and it will help you um, catch up with a lot of things that have changed in this century. So last century, we used to think it's a very niche field. Maybe a few million people are using it. You need specialized training. But today it has changed, right? We all use GPS, um, Google Maps, right? Food delivery and so on and it has become a very important part of this world. So, um, so first, connecting to the topic, what is responsible computing? And, you know, and Professor Jagdish mentioned quite a bit about it. Key thing is to think about the harm, right? And anything we do, if we are not engaged with the society, there could be unintended harm. And it's important to uh, involve social scientists, have the social feedback loop and so on. Uh, so the, there are two definitions. One is from the Mozilla Foundation. The second is actually from a National Academy study. You know, some of you may be aware the computer science uh, group is actually going through a study on responsible computing, and they're about to publish the report. In addition, the NSF Science Directorate Advisory Committee has formed a subgroup on this topic, uh, and CRA also is going to have a subgroup. And their worldview is a little broader. I mean, of course, uh, fairness and all those things are important, but they also have realized that computing is a much bigger part of our lives and, and affects physical infrastructure and many other things. So we need to go outside the cyberspace. You know, things we do impact a whole lot more than privacy and things of that kind. Right? So, so here I'm just showing you United Nations, you know, um, priorities for the society. And right now, even within United States, you probably know Biden administration is putting a lot of weight on climate. Right, and for your generation, that's probably is the biggest issue. And equity is another big topic, right? I mean, those are priority. But in addition, there are other things. You know, for example, during COVID-19, if you didn't have access to broadband and computing, probably it was hard for you to get the food delivery, right? 
So it's not just privacy. Even you can have food starvation, food deserts, right? And in the United Nations, you kind of start, that's number two, zero hunger, right? So all core infrastructure of our society, we're thinking about food, water, energy, transportation. Computing is integral part of all of that. And when we have impact, we have impact in all those areas and we need to think about it. Right? So this was the thinking behind our you know, recent NSF project, the first entry five years ago. And this is the largest project within smart and connected communities program in NSF, where uh, you know, with partnership with people in urban uh, you know, uh, social sciences, you know, we looked at a, a, a set of core infrastructure, about half a dozen. And within that, we wanted to think about equity as well as a few other aspects, well-being, health, and so on in cities. Right? And we took a spatial angle to it because that's a less controversial angle. You know, you can have, how many of you have seen map of food deserts, for example? Some of us, okay. So maps are a great way to think about inequality in access to core infrastructure. You know, it could be commute time to jobs. And I will show you some more examples. Right? So this project is coming to the end and it's computer science part you heard in the morning, Jayant presented some interesting aspects. If you had measures of inequality, some of which came from the information theory side like Gini function and so on, a uh, lot of them are computed on census data, which is very spatial in nature. And you have to be very cognizant of the spatial unit you are using, otherwise your results can change dramatically. And this is a major blind spot in many of the things you read in media or even in sciences. And you can see other, other projects of that kind. You know, most recently we were involved with some COVID-19 support for the state and so on. So, uh, so let's actually talk about what is spatial data science. And, um, and I'll also define geo-intelligence here. And this is actually older than computer science, right? So story I'm showing you is 1854, London cholera. And given the COVID epidemic recently, uh, this is still relevant, right? Back then, the science did not understand how cholera is spread. In fact, the theory, prevalent theory back then was Maizama theory, it spreads through air, okay, bad odors. But uh, John Snow in 1854 made a map that you see here, and that map actually showed that deaths were concentrated. They were not all over London, but they were in one area. Furthermore, the center of that hot spot was a water pump, right? So he went to city officials to argue that this water pump may have something to do with it. But science was not with him, right? Now, fortunately, you know, we, we may not like our politicians, but they're also pretty shrewd and smart. And they basically proposed a small experiment. They said, okay, let's try it. Let's take off the handle, see what happens. And it actually helped. And then, you know, it, it basically uh, changed the hypothesis, right? And fledgling germ theory was supported. You know, people started pointing microscope, Louis Pasteur and so on. 20 years later, you kind of see the science change its course. And today it has impacted our life in many ways. In cities, we, sewer, we separate you know, drinking water from sewer and all kinds of things. So this kind of gives you a sense of uh, the power of spatial part as well as its limitation. It's very good for coming up with conjecture, right? It came up with a hypothesis, maybe it's the water, right? But in order to make it science, you still had to do rest of it, right? Controlled experiments and theory and so on. And this is one thing, you know, sometimes Silicon Valley gets uh, carried away. I don't know how many of you remember end of theory article, Wired Magazine, none of you good. <laughs> this is the beginning of big data. That's what Silicon Valley was pushing. Of course, it was a provocation. I don't think they believed it, but a lot of time that happens in media. Okay? So, uh, so let's try to think about what has changed in all those years. So, so a lot of things have changed. First, you probably know that it's data is easier to collect now, and there's a whole lot more data, right? So in last century, you had to do surveys and you had few sensors and few satellites. Uh, this is kind of showing you Lewis and Clark expedition. Remember some of our presidents were geographers and it took them years and years to understand the new territories they had acquired. But today we have satellites, right? In last century, it used to take two weeks to scan the earth. Today you can scan the earth every day at meter resolution. Okay? So a whole lot more satellites. So data has increased. And, uh, and because of that, you can do different things. So this is the satellite. Many of you probably know these are last century satellites like a bus. These are nano satellites like a pizza box. One rocket, you can send hundreds of these. And companies like Planet and others have thousands of these, you know, or hundreds of thousands. So you can get a lot more data and it can give you many, many insights. Uh, and then there are, you know, other data sets. GPS we talked about. So some of you may realize now there are billions of GPS receivers. And if you're leaving your location services on, then cell phone companies, Apple, Google, all kinds of apps are tracking you, right? And this data has been for sale for 10 years 
but now it's available to even universities because of COVID-19. Because looking at your smartphone location, the state government could see the compliance to stay at home order, right? And we had access to these data sets to help Minnesota analysis and so on. Uh, this has become so critical that you may not realize this is as important as water and electricity today. GPS goes out because you know all the clocks are synchronized to GPS. Your electricity grid, everything would come to a, you know uh, have problems. So spatial has become ubiquitous. You know, probably one of the most interesting aspects of computing you, is, is these kind of data sets. And these are generating lots of data, which is very, very, very valuable, right? So, you know, my previous speaker will appreciate this coming from the business background, McKinsey report. This is early part of big data revolution. McKinsey had a big data report. There are four or five chapters there. And they estimated the value of each data. The biggest value was on spatial data, $600 per year, you know, which was two years ago, okay? A National Academy report recently puts it over a trillion dollar for remote sensing data, right? So these are big numbers. And my previous speaker will tell you that revenues of even Apple and so on don't compare with that, okay? Their stock price, you know, market value might, but not the revenue. And that's why every big company is in this business, right? You may wonder why Apple started Apple Maps, right? Uh, so we have a lot of these remote sensing GPS data, and then there are other data. You know, the exhaust Jagdish talked about, Actually, the true exhaust from the vehicles today is not just your CO2 and NOx, but you actually get hundreds of variables every minute, you know, about your energy use, about emission, and, you know, gigabytes of data coming out of each car, right? And this is very valuable, and I will show you that this is already, you know, coming in use. In addition, you have other data sets. Social media, a lot of them have location. And uh, even newer ones are coming. Dr. Arvind Rao, you know, he's here. He will tell you that, you know, if you are studying, say, cancer, then all the biopsies, now they can digitize and make a map at the cell level. You can see the distribution of cancer cell, immune cells of different types. And looking at the spatial pattern of that, you can try to see which therapies are effective and which ones are not, right? So tons and tons of these spatial data and thinking is, is there. Let me show you concrete examples. So I talked about food as a very important infrastructure. About 10 years ago, many of you uh, may remember Arab Spring, anyone remembers? Few of us, okay. Twitter took a lot of credit for it, but the root cause was food prices, okay, because there was food shortage. Um, and after that, all, you know, many countries came together to monitor world crops. So now every month you get a report using satellite imagery and some models. This is the last report about a month ago. And it is showing you that most areas crops are doing fine, except, you know, a little bit of Brazil and Argentina. So now you can get early warning, okay? And every food company, every government uses this report every month, okay? Uh, in order to take early action. So right now, as you know, and some of you can probably spot Ukraine in here. Okay, how many of you can spot it down here? It's a big food producer, wheat, a big wheat exporter. And with the war, it's going to be affected. So people are already planning the substitution. If, if Egypt is buying wheat from Ukraine, they are now looking for who has wheat reserves, right? They are going to India to buy that. So this is something you know, very important to our life. I think this is one of the coolest use case of this world. But here you have to be very responsible. You know, in order for people to trust this data, it's not enough to run your machine learning algorithm. You have to understand the nuances. The, the farms in Midwest are very different than farms in India or China in terms of diversity and so on. Satellite sensors are different. Machine learning algorithms are different. And at the end, you do ground truth verification. You send people in the field and double check your data, right? False positives are very expensive for us. So when we use machine learning or AI, very, we are very sensitive about false positives, and we put lots of guardrails in place, right, to reduce them. Uh, closer to the topic of this particular uh, meeting, you can even make your segregation and prejudice visible using this map. You know, Jayant was showing you some of the maps in the morning, right? I mean, spatial segregation in Detroit and others. But here are other things, you know, like Jitish was saying, if social consensus evolves, things will sort themselves out. Doesn't always happen. Our society has a lot of polarization. This is showing you the, the segregation in population today in Oakland area. This is 1930s redlining, okay? People had said, don't invest over there, right? And it, it still lingers, you know, almost 100 years, pollution and segregation. These things have not gone away. You know, it's almost a century or maybe more than a century, right? So you need the trust, like our last speaker said, trust. And if a society is polarized, it's very hard to evolve consensus. You need something else. And this is where government and policymaking comes in the play, okay? 
and they can make a difference as well. So there is a third party in all this discussion, not just civil society and business, but whether or not we like our politicians or government, they have a role to play. Okay? Okay. And there are other things which were very hard to see before. Open ocean, all of you know, and you must have seen these uh, news because on ocean, things are not as observable. So a lot of goofy things go on there, right? One of which is actually dangerous for our whole civilization, and that is overfishing, which affects biodiversity and so on. In past, it was very hard to monitor, but in recent years, ships are asked to report their location. This is originally for collision avoidance, but that data set now you can accumulate, and you can actually see where fishing vessels are. Okay? Not only that, you can start mining strange behavior. And here is one near Galagopas you know, Island. You see this ship comes here, reporting location, suddenly stops reporting location for two weeks, and then goes back. Well, we don't know what they were doing there, but it, they should be looked at more carefully. And you can go look at the satellite imagery and see what they were doing. You can actually see how deep the ship was. Did, did the draft change, which might indicate there was some illegal fishing, right? So these kinds of things are making uh, another priority, see at life. If you remember the United Nations candy bar, that was another priority, biodiversity. Okay? And a spatial data that is emerging can make a difference there. This is coming back to uh, something close to home. Okay? And this is something Jing Liu mentioned. I started a lot of my research with things which are now you know, something you experience through Google Maps. right? So you may wonder in 30 years, you know, what has research done, right? It all became commercial five, six years, you know, after I started this. So we were out of business. So, but we found new problems. One was evacuation route planning. After 2001, 9-11, this became popular. And then, you know, after that, recently we have been working on what we call eco-routing. So when you pick a route, instead of minimizing distance or travel time, you could minimize energy use or emission. So last 10 years, NSF DOE support, we are doing this. We are showing you some of our results in Ohio to, you know, plus, and this is a real result. This is not just lab simulation and so on. You actually had people, UPS vehicle drive and measure this. These two routes, you can see, they have different energy use, different travel time, okay? And most recently, you probably know, last October, actually, oh, Google Maps has announced support for eco route. Let's please raise your hand if, if you have used this. Okay, good, if you haven't, Pay, pay attention to that. There is a leaf in front of that. And if you are worried about climate change and so on, this is one of the small things you can do to, to, to make a difference. All right. Uh, so coming back to this, you might also think, well, you know, if you have all my phone location and so on, privacy will be a big deal, right? And it indeed is. And in this world, I'm just going to, again, build on Professor you know, uh, Jagdish, what he said. He brought up the business view and civil society view, and they're both important. But I will also add the government view is also important. You have seen that played out in COVID-19, right? For public health, it's important. National security, it's important. And ultimately, we have to find some consensus. And sometimes it emerges organically. And sometimes we make laws about it. So with geospatial data, this has been happening for, you know, in both ways. So one of the laws that many of you probably know is E911. This came into effect 2011. So when you're from your cell phone, you dial 911, your location is shared with the, the 911 center. And that everybody has agreed it makes sense, right? No problem. Now, what you may or may not realize is about five years ago, there was another law, which is now called wireless emergency alert. You know, some people may know of this as Amber Alert. How many of us know what is Amber Alert? Okay, good. Now, with this law, if you are traveling in an area which is dangerous, right? There is a dust storm there is a hurricane, there is a tornado coming, even if you don't press a button, I mean, government and cell phone companies knows where you are, right? They can send you an alert saying you are in an area which is risky. Please take precaution or move out of here, right? Uh, Hurricane Sandy was the first time, you know, this was implemented and so on. Another big issue that, you know, many of you know about is the census data, right? Where individual data is confidential, but aggregate is public. And those practices are also being brought to cell phone location data. So if you know about SafeGraph, in this data set was made open to researchers during COVID-19, uh, they have taken similar precaution, differential privacy and so on, right? So a lot of norms of best practices have been developing in this field. Of course, there is a whole lot more. Our, many of our apps are still stealing locations and we need to develop new norms and develop safe practices here. But this is certainly a big area of discussion. Okay. So 
So this was one thing about you know, the big data revolution. And among the biggest of the big data and most valuable and most important of the big data, I will argue the spatial data sets are those. And I gave you some of the examples. Okay? Now let's switch gear and talk about a few other things. Our previous speaker says we don't pay much attention to hardware. Right? So I'm going to talk a little bit about hardware. And it is something, you know, um, many university campuses have a parallel institution. So just like you have Midas here, uh, you know, Dr. Lu was telling me you also have research computing and a supercomputing center here, right? So there are parallel entities which help you experience this. And all of you know that, you know, in last century we used to have small computer, which, but now we have these big data centers and you can do a lot of things about it. And it turns out that, you know, if you look at these big supercomputers or big cloud computers, some of the biggest users are spatial users. And here are some examples that you might know about already. So Uber and Google Maps I will ignore, but I would like to point your attention about some of the things over here, because these spatial data sets are also very large. You know, for an average uh, researcher or even an average institution, it's not possible to even host those or have enough horsepower to process them. You know, these are petabyte data sets. But the good news is that a lot of them are moving to cloud now. Okay, and here are three cloud resources you should be aware of. And they have hosted a large amount of spatial data, you know, a lot of satellite imagery, the census data, and all kinds of things. If you are into machine learning, you might also enjoy that one of the DARPA project, Geospatial Cloud Analytics, you know, that has given data sets with labels. So you can go and have fun training your CNN to find buildings and cars and so on. Okay? Um, it has become so popular that, you know, I'll show you what's happening in terms of policy space. Okay? So you don't need expensive computers today, and you don't need major bandwidth networks today to, to play with this. And lots of startups are forming to exploit this data. And the use cases are mind boggling. So coming back to the business, you know, the world petroleum reserves, how much is in the storage? You can actually get out of satellite imagery because they have floating roofs and the shadows change based on the level, okay? The retailers, you know, when Walmart came to Minneapolis, which is a target country, the first thing they did was to have fly, planes fly over, take pictures of parking lots, okay, to know which locations have more traffic, right? That service is available today routinely, right? So you can find every car, every building, every tree, and things of that kind, and I will, that's what the space of geo AI is, and I will go there next, okay? Good, so let's maybe talk a little bit about what happens to this data. So a lot of this data is imagery, which is not easy to process through your regular statistics and so on. So in last century, it was very manual. You actually had a whole bunch of intelligence agencies and other companies just sitting and watching these data sets and manually trying to process them, okay? This is showing you Cuban Missile Crisis. You know, this is the aerial imagery which triggered that because when you see this pattern, does anyone know what this is, Star of David pattern? Why, why did President Kennedy get so upset when he saw this picture? This is the Russian missile site design in 1960s. Okay, once they see one of them, they flew plane and they found many other of them in Cuba, and that's what led to the crisis. But this was all manual. Today, in Ukraine crisis, you have probably watched this in news all the time. I'm not going to mention this, but you can actually start labeling things. You know, there are different kinds of things, and you can, you know, you can do much faster counting. Every day, they are reporting how many Russian vehicles were there and how many were destroyed, right? So parts of this image processing has been automated, and this is generally thought of as geo AI which appropriately is thought of as augmented intelligence, not artificial intelligence, right? And this has become so popular that US actually proposed export control. This is just a couple of years ago. And if you look at the workflow, it's very trivial workflow. How many of us have done deep learning kind of work here? Wonderful. Do you see anything interesting in this workflow? This is what your homework assignment is, right? Why would the US government want to put export control on this? And remember, this is not for face recognition. This is for geo imagery, okay? Not for, for other kind of imagery that computer vision people get excited about. Why is that? The Ukraine war tells you why is that, okay? So these are the most interesting, most important data set from business perspective, security perspective, and so on. If you can analyze geospatial imagery, you know a whole lot about not only your own country, but everybody's country. So, so anyway, I mean, this we already know in deep learning life, you know, the process is a little bit simpler. It can do feature selection and the learning and people have successfully trained it to find houses, vehicle and stuff like that. So I'm going to skip the last century stuff where you needed to know features like blue tarp to find people in Haiti. Now you can have a simpler workflow 
And, and this is something a lot of you have experienced from aerial imagery or satellite imagery. You first create some labels for learning and once train the network and in new imagery it can find those things, right? So no surprise here. Uh, you can find trees and all kinds of things here. So this is going on quite a bit and I'm going to kind of go to the next step, right? So GeoAI is very excited about it. And now I want to take you to the places where what is not happening in AI yet. What are the limitations of Geo AI and why you need to learn a little more about spatial data science to take the next step, okay? So, so let's think about what the CNN and deep learning and computer vision community is missing, right? There is a lot of hoopla, media and industry always gets excited. But here is one example. And this is from computer vision community itself. When you see this picture, number one, what do you think CNN will find about this picture? If you run CNN and all the technology I talked about it, what can they do with this picture? They can count how many Obamas are there, right? More than one, right? They can count how many people are there. But when an intelligence agent, you know, analyst looks at it, or you look at it, what do you see in this picture? A little more louder. Somebody is on the scale, but that more interesting is somebody else is on the scale and has a sense of humor, right? And so these kinds of things, you know, computer vision is still, you know, not ready to get into it, but these are the things humans look at it. That's why I call it augmented intelligence. It can flag some things. You still need humans to do things, right? So AI is a broader field. You know, you have vision, but you have a lot of other things. And many of you have taken courses. In fact, last speaker talked about natural language processing, right, and so on. So there are many other parts. And uh, interestingly, the spatial angle is often missing from those things. So I will start with natural language processing and tell you, you know, even simple things like Google, you know, what, what can you do? But even computer vision, you know, is mostly sticking to the visible band, right, and LIDAR. If you come from my field where we do remote sensing, you will realize we look at it in a much more richer manner, right? And why is it important? Just look at this, self-driving vehicle which has so much hoopla. In Las Vegas, in a heavy rain, not a single one could move, right? Because your visual band is not very good at that. If you want to look through water, you need a different man. You need thermal or you need uh, microwave and so on. So this is first telling you that even computer vision itself can benefit by interacting with remote sensing and, and you know, our, our world. This is what humans see. That's what computer vision people like to do. But human vision is not that great. You know, it, for example, in spy movies, you have seen, uh, no animation here. But anyway, infrared, we don't see. We don't see microwave, we don't see radar and so on, right? And in remote sensing, we do all of that. Re recently, there was a satellite lost with X-ray. You know, they were just launched with X-ray. So you can, you know, computer vision can come to our field and get things better. Uh, here is another, uh, sorry, animation. But, but let's ask this. If you, are, you know, if you go to Google and ask, type in this question, what's the distance between Washington, D.C. and USA? And I would have shown you the Google result here. But can you guess what will Google type in, right? Most of us will say zero, right? Washington, D.C. is inside USA. Google, Siri, Alexa, right? The greatest of our text processing engines. What would they say? Any guess? Yeah. Exactly, because the only thing they understand are points. They don't understand polygons. They don't understand line strings, right? So even this basic thing, you know, it's good for these systems to learn a little bit more about our world. This was standardized in 1995. Okay, basic geometry, points, line strings. This is available in every single, you know, spatial software. Post GIS, you know, Oracle Spatial. This is available in Python, Java. There is no excuse for Google not to figure this out, right? And so these are the basic things we should all know about. You know, you can use it, you know, when you like. And of course, there are more sophisticated things as coordinate systems, okay? There are lots of different coordinate systems. For example, if you take a measurement from your cell phone GPS, you want to publish it on Google Maps. Do you think you can just publish it directly or will, do you have to do something in between to make them compatible? How, how many think you can just merge the two? Do, do they use same coordinate system? They don't. So, so there are other things, but at least we should do simple geometry, you know? Okay, so, so, so this was sort of a basic thing, but let's go beyond the object detection, okay? We ran our CNN and we know how many vehicles are there where they are, right? What happens next? The analysts actually take that information and they start mining patterns, right? So I'm going to take you to data mining space. Some of you already know about it, but spatial patterns are unique and people do different things. One of the spatial pattern is hotspot, which in COVID-19 probably every one of you have heard about, right? 
So if you think about that London cholera example, you know, if you run it SAT scan, it will give you a circle. And it will do one other thing, because we want guardrails. We don't want to be fooled by noise. And that guardrail basically gives you the statistical confidence that such a dense circle is very unlikely to happen by chance, right? And that's a statistical confidence test and so on. There are other patterns. You know, this is sort of coming from Dr. Rao's world. If you see cancer cells and immune cells in, in this configuration versus that configuration, that has a lot of information for the doctors. Which one do you think has a better chance of recovering? How many of you? See, this one, the in immune cells, CCLs, are next to cancer cells. They can kill them, OK? If you see that, you are much happier. If you see that, it's not really very exciting, OK? And so on. So there are many patterns, and people do that. Now, how is it different from the classical data mining? And there are a couple of things I will mention. You know, uh, one of which is noise. It turns out that if you want to do dense area detection by our favorite methods in database world, so how many of us know DB scan here? Okay, very popular, very highly cited. But did you know that if you throw complete spatial random data to DB scan, it will still detect some hotspots, right? It has no consideration of noise. It has no consideration of statistical significance, right? So a recent paper in our group, we have added statistical significance testing to DB scan, right? Because for us, the false positives are very expensive. If I declare a neighborhood to be a disease hotspot, there are serious consequences, right? People stop going there. There's economic loss. Politicians lose elections, right? You know, it's different than showing an advertisement which is incorrect. Google doesn't lose much money doing that. So a lot of machine learning, which is catering to the advertisement world, they don't care about false positives as much. But we do, right? So we have additional steps. Uh, another issue is spatial continuity. And this is what Jayant was talking about in the morning where if you have continuous space and you want to analyze the data by discretizing it, you have to be very careful because your results will be sensitive to how you discretize the space. Okay? And uh, it's best not to discretize at all. In fact, the whole field of spatial statistics was created to move away from discretization. And they create something called a neighbor graph, which is based on the distance. Of course, your you know, measures you compute are function of distance, but those are reported and so on. Right? And the third challenge is are these challenges, autocorrelation, heterogeneity, edge effects, and so on. So again, you know, if you think about those and use models which are aware of those, your accuracy will go up, your residual errors would have less bias, and so on, right? So I'm going to actually skip next few slides because I think the animations probably would have caused little problem. So, but, but there are techniques, as I said, if you're concerned about dense area detection, which is noise resistant, at least use SAT scan. This is from National Cancer Institute. It will give you circular hotspots. If you are interested in more sophisticated methods, then you can use this significant DB scan, you know, and that can take out these, you know, this is what DB scan getting fooled by noise, right? But our techniques will not be fooled by that, okay? Um, and I will skip this continuous space as well. But spatial statistics teach you techniques which are based on neighbor graph, and you don't have to worry about discretization, okay? So let me actually try to skip the technical part. Uh, and go to the last part. Yeah. So I'll basically go to the last part, and that's essentially in terms of spatial data visualization. So this space, we are blessed. We are in low dimension. So you can often use maps and visualization to convey the information and so on. And a lot of that area is also developing. And I just wanted to mention one or two of them, one of which is this uh, Google time lapse. How many of us have uh, experienced this before? Few of us. OK, good. So this actually what it did was to take about 30 to 40 years of satellite imageries and stitch them up and make a video. So anywhere on the earth, you can go focus, and it will show you what happened in the last 40 years. So for example, here on Detroit Airport, if you play that video, you can see that airport changed dramatically, right, with the Delta and so on. So there, there's a lot of other things, you know, 3D, and you can do animations of this kind. So let me actually come to the conclusion. I mean, this was my, my main point. Spatial data is very important. Right? It's uh, economically valuable. It talks about that. It's socially valuable. You know, we are using it for some very, very societally critical things. And it has a rich tradition of a lot of things we are talking about, such as responsibility, because it, it has a very long history, and many people use it. The politicians know about it, because you know, if you know, how many of you know gerrymandering here? Right? Everybody knows that. So you can believe that politicians know very well about maps and, and how to do that. Right? So it's a language they understand. And there are some policies and norms have evolved. And some are evolving, right? So it's an important field. Uh, 
At the same time, in terms of techniques, if you use one size fit all techniques, you are only going to go so far, right? And you can do better by using some of the specialized techniques that have come out in this space. And, um, and coming back to our previous speaker and so on in terms of data science syllabus, one of the things our community, you know, this paper came out a couple of years ago. So we basically argue that all data scientists should have some exposure to spatial data, right? And, and the methods. And that's sort of our, my kind of uh, takeaway message. And, um, and this is the summary. I said spatial data has already transformed our society and there are many other new opportunities ahead. And that's why all of us, you know, different sectors, we should think about taking advantage of it and helping each other. Okay, so that's it. I will stop here and go to the next speaker. We'll get started. Uh, Michael Wellman is our next speaker. I already introduced you before you showed up. So please just get started. Uh, thank you. Uh, uh, this talk is uh, going to talk about some of our uh, work on uh, modeling AI and financial markets. Uh, I'm Michael Wellman. I'm from here in computer science. I lead uh, the strategic reasoning group. I'm an AI researcher. Uh, we study decision making in strategic domains. That's domains when there are multiple agents who make decisions that uh, interact with each other. Uh, and one of these is finance. And uh, one, of the, one domain where that is always the case is finance. Um, and for uh, you know, this audience, I encourage you to think of this as kind of a, a case study in, uh, in, in data science and multi-agent domains and how to think about how at least uh, one way to think about uh, societal implications or one approach to uh, trying to understand societal implications in a domain with very significant societal uh, import. Uh, so I often find it uh, necessary to explain even why uh, a computer scientist and AI person should be uh, interested in, in finance. Uh, it is, of course, a, a major sector of the economy, uh, the, um, uh, and one that's potentially fragile. Uh, the uh, 2008 financial crisis is a, is a fresh memory for you. I, for me, I know that many of you were like in middle school, uh, may, maybe then, uh, but uh, it was a, a pretty a, a major disruption to the global economy. Trillions of dollars of, uh, of output was lost despite the fact that there was no war and no pandemic and we didn't like forget how to do stuff, there was no natural disasters. Um, it was because of the financial system just got out of whack and got miscoordinated and, and, and froze up. Uh, so why is it uh, so fragile? Uh, the answer is because it's made out of information. Uh, that the financial system, what it is, is an interacting system of bets and beliefs about the future. If I lend you money, it's because I think that you will be in a position some years from now to, to pay me back with, with interest. And whether you can or not may depend on whether the person that you lent money to uh, will be able to pay you back. Uh, and I may know about that or may not. And we, you know, uh, what finance is, is a, it's a matter of, of allocating resources across time. We uh, pay some money to build a factory to build widgets because we think that probably in a few years people will want widgets. And they may or may not. They co could go out of style or maybe someone will come up with something better than widgets uh, and, uh, and that won't work. And so uh, it's all about beliefs. Some of them are right and some of them are wrong and they have to be coordinated and that makes them very fragile. And that makes it a very interesting kind of thing for a computer scientist to think about uh, as a very complex inter information system. Uh, so that fragility is combined with um, the fact that it's at the leading edge of automation by AI. So that should make, make us all feel very confident. Uh, 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 it's, one of, it, uh, it's one of the domains where AI is, uh, has, uh, autonomous agents are uh, acting very much. And the, the first example of that is in algorithmic trading, which is what I'm gonna mainly talk about today. Uh, what, so why is it that in a domain with, that's so fragile, and with such high stakes, you know, uh, trading, making bets about millions of dollars at once, uh, is things that we're trusting agents to do uh, right away. Well, the answer is because, first of all, it's, it's a convenient place for agents because there's very uh, simple, well-scoped interfaces to do things like buy and sell stuff in electronic markets. Uh, there's huge data volume and velocity, and computers have big advantages in, domain, in places where there's huge data volume and velocity, and I'll talk about that in a moment. Uh, uh, particularly when the speed of response is key. 
Uh, and of course, there's lots of uh, money involved. And if it works, um, then that's where it'll get adopted. But it's not just in financial markets. Uh, credit decision making is increasingly uh, being, I, I wouldn't say necessarily taken over, but enhanced by machine learning and, and, and AI, uh, both in consumer lending and even in business lending. Uh, and many other areas of finance are, are uh, a, a domain of, at the forefront of AI. So we think about algorithmic trading. Uh, the question, you know, it, uh, to even raise the question about are there implications of bringing AI into finance, we would say, is there something special about the fact that algorithms are, are, are there? Uh, and there, there, there's lots of reasons to think that there might be. Uh, I already alluded to the fact that uh, the, the computers have a big advantage in terms of speed, uh, volume of data, and, pr and precision. Uh, you know, we talk about um, reactions happening in the blink of an eye. Well, you know, a blink of an eye is a, on the order of 100 milliseconds. So in that time, AIs can have very extended conversations with each other back and forth over networks, um, you, know, you know, hundreds of rounds or so. Uh, so, uh, so if it's, there's going to be some issue about being able to respond to information quickly, uh, there's no, putting a human in a loop is not uh, a, a possibility, and, and certainly it's a big disadvantage if you have them. Uh, computers can also monitor lots of information all at once, things happening in, in different places and, uh, and times and bring it all together. Uh, there's a lot of new, a lot of strategies that one could play by bringing all that information together that were not even possible to do when it was human decision making. And so that raised the question, so what is the effect of these strategies uh, that may have never existed before. Uh, uh, latency arbitrage is, is taking advantage of uh, some, some of the small differences in, t in reaction times uh, that will necessarily exist in, a, in a, any kind of decentralized information system and use it to advantage. Uh, now, since there's not a human in the loop, where these systems are, have to be fully autonomous, um, that means that they're gonna make decisions in maybe some situations where their programmers understood what the decisions would be, but maybe some unanticipated uh, strange situations that they did not fully anticipate. And we have to have reliability. So when we put autonomous systems in environments that may be novel, we might wonder what's going to happen. Um, and the final thing I'll mention is, is scalability. If you have a new idea about a trading strategy and you can try it out uh, like on NASDAQ or something, well, then you could immediately also try it on the New York Stock Exchange, and you could try it on the Tokyo Stock Exchange, and you could try it in the bond markets and in the, uh, in the foreign exchange uh, currency markets and the cryptocurrency markets, if, if you wish, uh, all at once, all over the world. And so the spread, the proliferation, of, of change can happen much faster than it can in, uh, with respect to human ideas about trading. So lots of reasons to think that there is a question about implications. Um, so my group has, um, uh, we study strategic de decision making in a lot of domains, but we've done a, uh, focused a lot of our effort on finance. And I, uh, I, I've listed a, a few of the domains that we've studied on the right. I'm not, certainly not gonna go through all of them, but I'm, I'm gonna give you a, a couple of uh, examples of some of, this, of, of studies that we've done. Uh, our approach is to use uh, agent-based simulation modeling. So we build models of financial markets with artificial agents in which we can inject situations and inject strategies, uh, both based on what we think exists in the world and based on what we think could be learned or, or devised. Um, but you know, a, a problem with agent-based uh, simulation is that the behavior, of course, depends on what behavior, the, the overall results depend on what behaviors you program into the agents. And you can get almost any behavior, any outcome out if you can pick the behaviors. And so the trick is to pick the behaviors that are likely to exist in the, in the world. And one constraint or filter on what's likely is what is rational, what survives a kind of rationality filter based on a kind of game theoretic uh, analysis. And that's, that's the approach that we take. Uh, so I, I'm going to talk about a, a, a couple of studies, but let me also first just preface with um, a framing of some of the issues in, in, in ethical terms. Uh, I, have, I, I wrote a paper a few years ago with a colleague in the, uh, in the Ross School of Business, uh, Uday Rajan, in, in finance, um, called Ethical Issues for Autonomous Trading Agents. It's, actually, it's, it's the only paper that I wrote that has ethics in the title, and I kind of even regret doing that because um, I, I, I don't want to suggest that this is necessarily a moral issue, or, uh, you know, it, but it's more of one of understanding the implications 
uh, and uh, how to think about it, what algorithmic trading, autonomous trading agents brings to uh, the world. Uh, first observation is that you know, law and regulatory processes are slow to change. And technology can change fast, and AI certainly, you know, even though algorithmic trading has been around for uh, 15 or even 20 years, um, the law around it has not really adapted much to, um, to, to meet that, and we've already seen that there are reasons that there might. One could ask, well, in the absence of law, can there be ethics and norms to fill the gap? Um, even asking the question, I have to say, I'm pretty skeptical uh, of that. Um, exhortations about um, ethical principles, especially by professors, are unlikely to um, dramatically constrain uh, the, the, the finance world of, of trading. Um, but nevertheless, it's, it's, it, it, you know, having the, the broader conversation can guide uh, regulatory processes and we hope maybe help them accelerate. Uh, you know, we basically live in a world, and this is true for finance, but also true in, in many other domains, where the, the, the legal system is uh, geared towards uh, human decision makers, uh, does not really contemplate a world where uh, computers are making the decisions, and sometimes there, that leaves uh, big loopholes, uh, say. And one of the biggest loopholes uh, is intent, uh, and particularly in the, domain, in the domain I'm going to talk about, market manipulation, uh, a lot of the law is written in terms of what was intended to happen. Uh, and when it's an algorithm doing it, uh, there's some indirection uh, in intent that is often a little bit hard to um, un uncover. And I'll, I'll you know, point that out in a, a, bit, a little bit more. So I'll, I'll talk about market manipulation in, in a bit. So in this paper, we, we uh, developed a framework we call the arbitrage bot, or ARBOT. And we stratify different levels of uh, behavior that can be viewed as for passive to uh, active or aggressive. So this R bot is what ex exploits the computer's natural advantage and looking at a lot of information and seeing where there might be opportunities to make profits by trading. And arbitrage is when you see a situation where you see one uh, transaction you can make, say, to buy something at one price, and then you could sell it at a higher price somewhere else the exact same thing. And really, a, a lot of trading strategies are versions of that, maybe not literally the same thing, but maybe kind of almost the same thing, or you could change it to be the same thing, or it's statistically the same thing. And just by stretching those, those notions of sameness and identity a little bit, you get uh, broader and broader kinds of uh, uh, expected to be profitable activities. So you, computers can be really good at this. Uh, and that can be fine. In some ways, arbitrage it can be very beneficial. It can make markets more efficient. It could, it, it, if you have something that is, is exploiting differences in prices, that is, good, that is going to tend to make the prices be the same in different places, and that can make markets m work more effectively. Uh, but it also can lead to other problems. And one of the problems is that if you're really good at arbitrage, then you have a kind of strong incentive to make those opportunities arise even where they wouldn't have otherwise, or make the opportunities bigger than they would have. So, uh, arbitrage it comes up more when the prices are very volatile. So if you have ways to make prices more volatile, um, then you can, and you're good at taking advantage of that, uh, then you might do that. And so that's the thing that we might be worried about algorithms doing. And an example is market of uh, many kinds of market manipulation can be viewed as that. I'm going to talk about spoofing uh, a bit more. Uh, there's 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 yet further ways of of um, gaming the regulatory system and other things to create new arbitrage opportunities. We've seen a, a, a high fragmentation of, of financial markets in the United States um, that you know, is, is, is possibly because of, of interest there are in, in exploiting advantages from fragmentation. And then all the way to malicious subversion, and this is where you get into the uh, you know, real attacks on markets and uh, really on, the ver on uh, leading into the edge of cybersecurity kinds of things. And of course, uh, in, uh, when there's geopolitical conflict or even when there's money to be made, that's a thing to worry about as well. But I'm going to stay even at the upper, more benign, what's seemingly more benign levels and ask whether actually are those good or uh, bad. And when I say you know, w good or bad in terms of societal effects, and I'm, I definitely don't want to say good or evil. Uh, you know, and I, I, I mention this because I, wherever I go to, and talk about um, implications of, of AI, uh, audiences really want to get this kind of good or evil classification going, and there, and and I, I, th I think in whenever you're talking about responsible computing or you know uh, ethics of AI, uh, recognize there often is a, a people really want to get a simple answer: who's the good guys and who's the bad guys. And I think it's to be resisted. 
it is they don't it's not always black hats and white hats there's there's new technology that can have beneficial effects in some situations and harmful effects in others and maybe beneficial on some people and harmful on others and and it, parsing it is out is what is what our role as scientists for doing less on um, you know pounding the um, uh, the, the uh, you know making sermons about it okay so uh, market manipulation that that's the level two of that hierarchy I, I mentioned the uh, Securities and Exchange Commission in the United States has a Definition, intentional conduct is designed to deceive investors by controlling or artificially affecting the market for a security. So there it is, that word intention. So uh, how would you determine the intention of some actions that one takes in a market? Well, if it's a person, you might cross-examine them and say, why did you do this? And actually, you, you, you can't be sure <laughs> that you're re re revealing intention of what people do is, is often you know, quite hard unless they left, you know, uh, some documentary evidence about what their plans were. Uh, it can be even it can be harder for a computer uh, often because a programmer. Can, remember, I talked about unanticipated, unanticipated situations. The programmer can say, "Oh, you know, I wrote this program, yes, and it followed my instructions, but I didn't realize it would be in this situation, and you know, and and therefore that would be that would come up." Uh, now, um, there also are, you know, ironically, some, some potential advantages for interrogating computers because unlike people, you can ask an algorithm what it would have done in a different situation that didn't actually happen uh, and get a reliable, you know, and, and, and run the code and see, see what it would have done. And there may be some really interesting opportunities uh, for uh, enforcement that way. Uh, spoofing is a particular kind of market manipulation, which I'll illustrate in a moment. Uh, the Dodd-Frank legislation has a definition uh, that, um, Notice also has that magic word intent in it, putting in offers that you intend to cancel before they execute, okay? And again, how do you tell from a trace of data whether somebody intended uh, what they intended to do? Uh, anyway, it's tricky. So uh, uh, one of my, uh, we, we have a, a paper that appeared in uh, the journal Games uh, last year that talks about our work in spoofing. I'll give you a, 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 just a slice of it. So I'm showing some headlines shows this stuff really happens. Uh, uh, in fact, I, I gave this talk in one setting uh, where someone in the audience is, is somebody who uh, made a lot of money in the tech world, and I, I described what spoofing was, and he said, oh, I do that. I said, no, no that's illegal. You should not be admitting that in public. It happens a lot. This is a, a, a diagram that it was part of a prosecution, a successful prosecution of a, of a spoofing case. It's really a, a textbook one, and I'm not going to... Uh, uh, go through it in the full detail, but in the beginning part, let's see, is there a pointer? Here we go. So first, um, they put in a buy order. This is, I, I'm calling it a true buy order. They really do intend for this to execute. Then what they do is they put in these spurious sell orders, the spoofing, to try to uh, mislead the market to think that there's sell pressure so the price will come down. And if the price comes down, then their, their um, buy order will get executed, as it does here, and now they want the price to go up. So now they put in spoof orders on the buy side, again, below the market, but to kind of try to mislead the market to thinking that there's, there's more demand to buy than there is. Price goes up, and then they get to sell it at a higher price. They make some money. It's a you know, pump and dump is a kind of spoofing. Uh, uh, this happens um, uh, all the time, every day. And regulators are you know, looking at ever clever ways of, and they hire lots of data scientists to help them try to find this. Uh, we wanted to understand under what, you know, whether, how much is spoofing um, uh, rational? Can it really work in, um, in a realistic model? And can, uh, and what are the effects? And this is my student, Chintong Long, who uh, finished her PhD on this topic. So I'll, I'll give you a flavor of her, of, uh, her study. Uh, the um, approach we take is a, a, a methodology we call empirical game theoretic analysis. It's uh, combining uh, simulation-based modeling uh, with uh, game theory. And we go through an iterative process of uh, defining some plausible strategies, um, simulating them to get generate data about what happens when those strategies are played together. That From that data, we build a game model. We analyze that, uh, and maybe from that, think of new strategies that could try to break the equilibrium of that game model and continue until we have a, a, a game model that we feel is a pretty uh, good representation. And, uh, that, and what happens in the equilibrium of that game is what we view as a, as a plausible outcome. 
So I'm going to just go right to showing you some results, and it's going to take me a, just a bit to explain what I'm, I'm showing here. Um, so uh, it, we, pu we put in two kinds of trading agents, um, and these are kind of standard uh, categories of agents from the literature. HBL is, stands for heuristic belief learning. ZI stands for zero intelligence. Uh, why they're called that exactly uh, is not too relevant for our situation. But the key distinction between us is that while zero intelligence uh, like the name suggests, is not very sophisticated strategy. Um, in fact, they just don't even, they just decide what they want to buy or sell things for and they just put an order in the market. They don't pay, they don't really look at the market very much. Heuristic belief learning, as the name suggests, try, is looking at market prices and trying to figure out what the rest of the market is and what the probabilities are of, of, of success and uh, optimizing their bids accordingly. So HBL is a little bit more sophisticated. Well, a key thing about market manipulation the manipulator is trying to mislead you about the market. Well, if you're oblivious to the market, not paying attention anyway, you cannot be misled. <laughs> uh, so, um, uh, you know, you know, it's a, a great way to avoid being subject to, you know, Russian bots on Facebook is not to what go on Facebook. Uh, the uh, not not always a, a possible strategy, but but in any case, um, uh, we looked at. Um, whether uh, looking at the order book information uh, is something that is valuable. Uh, and we verified over this case we have uh, 18 environments, so we have a uh, somewhat smaller number of agents on the left, somewhat more on the right, and then ABC123 are just different parameter settings for the environment. Uh, and we did an equilibrium analysis of each one to look at, in equilibrium, what is the percentage adoption of uh, HBL, the ones that are sophisticated and look at the market. And you see that uh, almost always the equilibrium has a pretty high probability of using that. So looking at what all this is basically saying is that yes, in this model, market information actually is useful for making decisions. And you should use, you, 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 you should use it um, some of the time. Um, and it's beneficial to the market to, to use it. So uh, this chart is the same environments, but it's, a, it's showing on the y-axis uh, the uh, accuracy of price discovery. Uh, it's a root mean square deviation of sort of the true fundamental value of the security and what prices actually uh, are used in the market. So lower is more accurate. Uh, and we see that um, the, uh, in the markets where we allow HBL, those are the blue ones, versus the, the red triangles where we disallow HBL, the uh, accuracy is higher, right? So the, the error is lower. Okay, so the ability to, that, we, that agents are paying attention to the prices is actually kind of good for market price discovery. It's also good for market efficiency measured by surplus, um, and this is the same chart. Now more is, now higher is better, and again, the blue dots are the ones where their HBL is allowed, and the, uh, the red triangles where they're not, and we tend to have higher um, efficiency when it's allowed. So we want we want uh, agents to be using market information. Uh, so um, let's now put in a spoofer, and what this shows is that we're able to uh, a spoofing strategy that does something like that I showed you in that chart earlier uh, actually does succeed in moving the prices. So here we just say at price time 1,000, start spoofing in the, to move the prices upward. And in, in a market that it has um, HBL traders, um, it's gonna work. It's gonna increase the price, at least for some period, and depending on other market configurations, how long it's gonna last, exactly how high does it, does it, does it go. Okay, so we have the background traders and the spoofer. How does putting in a spoofer affect the welfare of the traders? Well, uh, we show separately the, the effect of the profits of the HBLs and the ZIs. Um, and uh, the HBLs are the blue ones, and those are negative. So the HBLs lose money. The ZIs, as I mentioned, they're oblivious. They're not, gonna be they're not affected by the manipulation. So it's maybe not surprising that they don't, lose, they don't lose out by spoofing. What maybe is a little surprising is they actually benefit. So uh, uh, why is that? Well, it turns out that Bringing in someone who's going to mislead the other ones you're competing against is actually going to help you if you're if you're if you're not affected by them. 
Now, as you can see, the negative effects on the HBLs far outweigh the positive effect on, on the ZIs, and we'll show the overall welfare uh, a bit later. But it shows it's, not, not, it's actually not quite uh, ambiguous about who is helping and who is hurting. Um, now, that was assuming that the agents were doing what they were doing and the spoofer came in kind of by surprise. What you really should do, of course, is say now the agents may, should know that a spoofer might be present or is present uh, and let them re-equilibrate, let them choose their strategies not knowing. And you think, well, if there's spoofer around may, and I was looking at the market price information, maybe I shouldn't, maybe I should be oblivious. And sure enough, it does reduce the probabilities that you're going to use HPL, but it, it generally doesn't go to zero. Um, and so you see that with spoofing, that's the orange ones, the, 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 the HPL adoption is a bit lower, but it's, it's often quite positive. Okay, so it doesn't totally um, tell you you should ne never use market information, but you should maybe be, you should discount it more, be, be more skeptical of it. Um, so now we can compare equilibrium to equilibrium and say, um, uh, what is the market surplus with spoofing? And the answer is it reduces surplus. And notice, uh, no, when, I, when we count surplus here, we are not just saying it's bad for the other agents. We're, we're, we're giving credit to the spoofer. They're going to make money, and we let them keep their money. But uh, over the overall you know, welfare is even, even including that, they're, they're, they're take, it's not a zero-sum game. It's a negative-sum game. They're taking more from uh, everybody else. Okay, so this say is saying spoofing is, has a negative effect. And th this, this might seem kind of obvious. Actually, it's something that gets debated in economic literature. There's some, there, you know, th there, uh, I, I showed you there's laws against it. It seems wrong to mislead others, uh, right? That seems kind of apparent. But economists maybe argue that, well, it, 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 it doesn't necessarily have a negative effect. They're hurting you know, themselves or, or others. Um, you know, it's not actually, um, uh, uh, illegal to lie, you know, in, in a market, right? There's a, that, that's that, that's that, there's the, the rules against that, and so that's probably why it's hard to write some of these regulations. Uh, but it actually does have a negative effect, and there's all kinds of additional questions that we uh, could study, and some of them we have, and I'm not going to uh, go into them today. Uh, but really understanding, okay, now that we know how we have a model where it happens, how could we mitigate it, uh, either by changing the market rules or changing our strategies, introducing new strategies. Um, and all of those, those things can be done to uh, some degree. Uh, there's even, uh, we, we've even done some studies on what happens when we include spoofing detection and uh, look at the game of a detector versus an evader, right? Once you, there's always going to be an arms race between te detection technology and the ability of a manipulator to try to make their actions look less like spoofing, right? So you, the textbook case, we know how to pattern match and see that one. But okay, well, they can try to obscure what they're doing and make it look like other legitimate strategies. And um, uh, that, what, what is the end point of that game is something that uh, uh, nobody really knows. Okay, so um, I'm going to go uh, a bit uh, uh, more quickly into an, another example of looking at effects of uh, algorithmic trading. And you know, unlike this is not even in the category of something like manipulation, which on its face seems like it should be um, uh, deleterious, but uh, more simple strategies. I'm looking at the effects of very simple trend-following policies um, on financial market stability. And this was work done by my student, uh, Eric Brinkman. So this is meant to be an example of a very simple technical trading strategy. It's simpler than anything that anyone would actually do, but actual Technical trading strategies are just more sophisticated versions of this you could think of. So what happens in this strategy, you, you would expect would be at least part of what happens in the more sophisticated um, case. So let me, um, uh, this one I'll show mostly through these kinds of plots here. So um, uh, in this plot, I'm showing a simulation, a run of a market over time. The yellow is the fundamental. This is meant, this is representing, say, the, the true idealized value of the security, uh, and agents know something about that value. They may also have their own I values or issues like, you know, regardless of the value, I need to pay college tuition, so I got to <laughs> sell my stock, right? So th th there's, other, there's other values beyond what the, the value of the security is that drive trading. And so what you expect is that the actual price that you observe would kind of dance around, you know, would, would, would track the fundamental, but not exactly perfectly. And that's what happens. Uh, we, at time 5,000, um, inject a shock 
which is uh, um, just some exogenous big sell order. Someone just, for some reason, just is liquidating their holdings, and that's going to drive the prices down. It's going to put you kind of out of equilibrium for a little while, um, but it, you expect it to come back up. So in this model, the agents, uh, when they arrive to the market, they, they just know what the fundamental is. And in that kind of world, you're going to um, uh, adjust quite quickly to the shock because the price goes down, but the people come and they know what the true value is, and so it'll, it'll go right back to tracking that pretty soon. Uh, that's not a very realistic. Uh, more realistic is that there's kind of some kind of noisier partial information that different parties have about the true value uh, of a security. Uh, so in this case, we would model it as you get some kind of statistically associated value. And other uh, uh, participants in the market, they have their own observations. And in a world like this, you realize that, well, I know something about the value, but the market as a whole collectively knows stuff that I don't know. And so there's information in the prices that I see about what the value is. And I should take that into account when I decide how much to offer to buy or sell things. So in that world, you're going to adapt your strategy to take into account those market prices. Now, you know, as you, th that will also you know, still track the fundamental, maybe a little bit less well. But now when we induce the shock, the shock is going to have a, a more persistent effect. Uh, why is that? Because when there's the big sell order comes in, I don't really know. Does that mean like something really bad happened to this company? Like maybe you know, um, uh, you know, maybe the company had some bad outcome, or maybe you know, Elon Musk tweeted something, or who knows? Some, maybe there's some, something that happened that I don't know about, and, and I'm going to see that price, and I'm going to maybe you know, uh, not believe what I my, my own information. And you know, as long as eventually nothing, nothing else happens and there was no really true change, eventually uh, the, the, the things will adjust. Okay? Now, the fact that there are frictions like this, that there's you know, these periodic shocks or just you know, other you know, effects of noise and this imperfect tracking, um, there may be some just other information that exists in the price time series. So in this world where there's these kinds of frictions, we could plot just empirically um, uh, the degree of mispricing that exists and trends of, of adjustments in the same direction. So you notice that uh, when there's this shock, you see uh, many transactions in a row go, go down, and then you, on the way back up, there's many, many transactions in a row going up. And if you see that, you say, hey, maybe it's really on the way up. <laughs> it's part of adjustment. I should get ahead of that. And, I, and a trend-following strategy could be beneficial. And this, this data here suggests that it likely would be, so that if I've seen a long trend, that's actually evidence that things are out of whack, and I should maybe try to um, accelerate that. So that's a profit opportunity. So we put these trend, that's a, then there's a, a very a simple trend-following strategy in. All it does is it, it says I'm going to uh, Look for these trends. If I see a trend above my threshold, I'm going to say six. If I see six movements in a row, then I'm going to go in and buy and then put it and try to sell it at a higher price. And that's, that's if it works, that's great. If it doesn't work, eventually I'll just you know go you know try again later. Uh, this is uh, like the, the simplest possible technical strategy you could imagine. You know, in real life people do things like this, but much more sophisticated. Um, but actually, this is profitable. So, if you, I mean, in, in our, in our you know, world here with, uh, of other agents, adding this is, uh, will, will exist in equilibrium. So now, what happens w now when you put a shock in the market when you have trend followers? So here I'm showing the version of the shock is gr in gray without the trend followers, and the darker one is with the trend followers. And you see that the trend followers make the shock have a, exacerbates the effect of the shock. Okay, why is that? Well, they see the price going down, and that's a trend, and they're going to jump on it, and they're going to amplify it. They're going to get ahead of that trend, and they're going to make it go further than it would have gone otherwise. Um, and then, you know, they'll eventually, the real information will take hold, and it'll it'll go back. Um, but there was a, a a bigger, it was an amplification of the shock, which is generally what we define as uh, negative, you know, not a, a, a instability, right? The, uh, the effect against stability. Okay, so, but the trend followers is doing what they were supposed to do, right? We, we observed that there was evidence, you know, that trends would be correlated with mispricing. They reduced the amount of mispricing when you add the trend followers, 
right? They break, they break that relationship a little bit. Um, another thing that they do, and it's similar to the spoofing story I told before, is they crowd out use of transaction price information. So again, if I know there's trend followers out there, uh, when I see in stuff in the market, I can say, I don't know if that's based on the ones who really know stuff or just based on these technical strategies that are amplifying trends. Uh, and so I'm going to discount my belief in the information I see in the prices. And we saw before that was, you, in the spoofing world, that was we wanted parties to use price information. Um, and so uh, if in equilibrium here, you know, there's multiple equilibrium, you can get different results, but it tends to reduce the amount of trend, um, it tends to reduce the amount of traders that will use transaction price information. Okay. Uh, now we can, uh, we re-equilibrate, so now we should rerun this market where now the market has adjusted to the fact that there exist these trend followers, and so they're going to change their own strategies to take into account of that. Now we add the shock, and we see um, uh, the effect like this. So now um, there's less use of price information. And so remember that very first graph I showed you where no one was using price information because they just knew it all, and the, it, we adjusted right immediately from the shock? So here, Reducing the use of the price information does make things recover faster. So it, 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 now if you look at the dark line, it, it does go uh, a, a little bit deeper. The trend followers amplify it a little bit. It goes a little bit further down. But then when it turns around, it goes faster back up because there's less parties that are using the price information as a basis. So, so the, uh, the trend followers are just going to drive the prices back up faster uh, too. Okay, so uh, we see that um, overall, the trend followers um, exacerbate the shock impact. If you just measure the the, the largest displacement of the um, of the prices, so they exacerbate it in that way. But um, they also help recovery. Uh, so um, if you just look at they say the area of that's displaced, it's it's less bad, and that's what this kind of measures. So it's a little bit of a mix and a kind of surprising story. We amplify it in a sense. We goes deeper, but it's na but it's narrower. So the net effect may even be beneficial uh, uh, of these trend followers if you're concerned about specifically about uh, you know things like this shock. You know, and to this day we don't you know, uh, don't understand uh, a lot of the dynamics and the causes and the possible remedies for things like uh, flash crashes. There was a very famous one 12 years ago now, uh, the so-called flash crash of uh, where you know. The, the stock market went down very suddenly, very quickly, and then came back. Uh, it could be that AIs also, like here, were uh, part of, were maybe part of the problem, but also part of the solution in uh, in, in the quick recovery. That doesn't mean it's going to uh, work out so well the next time uh, that happens. Okay, uh, there's a slight reduction in market efficiency, which uh, is due to that crowding out of of, of uh, the users of price information. Uh, Okay, so uh, just to, to summarize this part, um, this study showed that even a simple trend-following strategy can be rational. Uh, you know, that seems to violate uh, market efficiency, you know, hypotheses. But uh, if you recognize that there actually are frictions in the market, it, you can rationalize the existence of this. Um, uh, the um, uh, it'll it'll reduce the price awareness of the market because it degrades the value of market information um, and, and therefore to reduce efficiency a little bit, but it can have a kind of a mixed effect on the, on the shock response. And so again, this is one of these um, examples where the, if you ask the question, is it good or bad that we have algorithms doing these strategies, it's, 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 it's ambiguous. Uh, uh, it seems like it's not terribly bad and it has good aspects and, 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 and bad aspects. And I think that's gonna be true of uh, a, a number of things. Okay, so uh, just to conclude overall, um, I, I really find it a very interesting domain to study, uh, algorithmic trading. Uh, I'm an AI person. This is at the leading edge of what autonomous agents are doing um, uh, in the world. Uh, I'm also concerned um, about the fact that we don't understand all the implications of it, and uh, particularly the, um, uh, uh, the frontier of sophisticated machine learning methods that can learn better and better ways to manipulate markets and whether we can keep up in our regulation. Uh, 
AI maybe is part of the solution, but you know, I, th I think just as in the very analogous domain is um, uh, misinformation on, say, social media, right? Detecting false, um, you know, spread of false information. Every um, improvement in detection technology can immediately lead to improvements in evasion technology. That's just how, if you know about, um, you know, adversarial learning, that's how it works. That that, but automatically. Um, uh, improving detection improves evasion. Uh, that's that's pretty. That's a pretty um, uh, unsettling, <laughs> but uh, unavoidable, but fact of the, of these domains. Uh, nevertheless, we can try to understand them by modeling um, uh, these games, and uh, we think that uh, uh, this approach of combining simulation and game theory is very um, effective. There, we're looking at a lot of other domains in in finance. Uh, you know, I mentioned before the fragility of the financial system and financial interdependent financial networks, and we do a lot of modeling of that, as well as other you know, regulatory domains. Uh, I guess the other thing I'd, I'd add about um, studying regulation or thinking about, you know, what I think data science can very often inform regulation. Uh, but what is really key and a major limitation of database studies of um, related to regulation is that. Uh, the data only tells you what happened in the world without the regulation. <laughs> if you're thinking about some new regulation, you want to understand what would be, what what would the response be? And you notice in the studies that I talked about, we introduced something like a spoofer or a shock, and then we said, okay, now let's recognize that the participants in the market would know that's happening, and they're going to adjust their strategies about that. The same is true about regulation, uh, and we need a model. If you're talking about a regulation that hasn't been written yet, there's no data in the world that is directly answering that. You need a, you ultimately need a, you need a model. You need some kind of causal assumptions uh, that's going to uh, let you uh, think this through. Uh, I think data science has a lot to say about building causal models too, but it can't just be based on the um, uh, information you have in what, uh, in in the in the in the domain without the intervention. Okay. Okay, and I'm done. Thank you very much. All right, so we're coming full circle here. I'm uh, coming back to some of the things that we heard from Jack earlier today and also hope that I can provide a little counterbalance before you all go into spatial statistics and financial markets that uh, the social sciences uh, have interesting things to, do, to offer both in, on the research side as well as in uh, the public sector where they do need data scientists like you and um, I hope that in the discussions later today and tomorrow, we can have an eye on that uh, area as well. Um, what I uh, want to talk about here and, and prep us for discussions is, you know, a, give you a couple of examples um, on applications of AI uh, in the labor market setting, health settings, and uh, I guess the latter one just in passing since many of you know those anyway. Um, I, I do want to remind you of something that Jack said earlier. Uh, these are areas in which there aren't necessarily high velocity, high volume data streams and maybe therefore AI should not be used. But I, I will at least at, at the beginning make a case why people are interested in using it, right? And I think that's important to, to keep in mind. And the, the main part, though, is I want to um, highlight where I think we all, as we work in this space, make decisions along the way all the time. And where uh, decisions we have to own up, you know. And, um, and then I do want to sort of give an outlook on a couple of recent approaches, uh, research done, initiatives done to mitigate some of these problems. So on the example side, um, if you think about taking up a data science position in government agencies, statistical agencies, um, whether this is in the US, in Europe, or internationally, UN level, you will find that everywhere there is a gigantic push 
to use data of all sorts uh, to create um, indicators that describe how well the nations are doing. And uh, Jack and I actually were on a National Science Committee a few years ago now, five maybe or something like that, where uh, that was sort of at the, the height of the discussion in the US, the US Census Bureau, but also many others really trying to figure out which of these new data sources they can use and what are the conditions under which they can be used and what could be the problem. Since then, a lot of progress has been made and uh, there are really a lot of interesting initiatives that have managed to sort of convert um, in data into indicators for um, uh, tracking how well sustainable development goals are met. You know? And at the forefront of these initiatives is um, the uh, Statistic Netherlands, I just realized we're looking at the PDF and not the PowerPoint, so you don't see the little GIF animation. Uh, Statistic Netherlands is tracking um, commute between home and work um, using cell phone data. They have a collaboration with all kinds of telecommunication companies and, and uh, are tracking that. Um, a large amount of work from many agencies has been done to measure poverty across the world using satellite images. And uh, and then administrative data are a set of data that we, I guess in data science classes, don't talk about as much, but in practice is used a lot. And they do in a way qualify as, if you will, you know, continuous data streams of large size. And uh, they certainly have all kinds of problems associated with them that, uh, that we can, you know, talk about. Um, they are, for example, used in the labor market context to uh, uh, profile the unemployed. And um, this is something that, that has been started in the US a while ago. It has become very popular and part of the AI community discussion, uh, sort of, you know, starting 2019 when Austria got into the game and really took this to the next level. They, what they're doing is they're trying to use administrative data on past, uh, you know, job, I mean, I guess data similar to the unemployment insurance uh, records here, you know, the, the information that feed into the social security system on what kind of job you had, which kind of training program you went through, what is the wage, how long did you kept the job and those kind of things. And the goal with uh, their modeling is that they can predict who is likely to become a long-term unemployed person and then launch interventions to those people. Mm -hmm. So it's a assistive AI model, not punitive, important to keep in mind because some of these decisions weigh more heavily in a, in a punitive setting. But, um, you know, and these things have been done before. If currently in a lot of countries, you have job centers that, and there's a, you know, an agent, an, a human agent sitting at the job center and they are trying to make a recommendation or they will enroll someone in an intervention program. And uh, the problem with these human deciders is they're inefficient, takes forever, you know. Uh, they are very subjective. As, as we heard earlier, you know, humans have their biases and, you know, prejudices on who might be, you know, not be able to hold a job and the like, right? So the hope of, you know, anyone employing these kind of systems is that you could get rid of those kind of prejudice, right? That, you know, it's just let the data speak. Let, let's be like equally fair to everybody. That, and so, so the employment of these AI systems in this context is actually an attempt for fairness and not an attempt for, you know, just making efficiency and, and, um, and then deal with the resulting possible unfairness afterwards. The first set of uh, movement in that direction was uh, rule-based models that they, they, they are clear thresholds, you know, if you did this or that in the past, then uh, you qualify or you don't. That tends, when you look at the literature, to be quite ineffective, as in the wrong people will be ended up getting supported. You know, maybe folks that would have made it themselves, there are just not enough variables that are considered or features that are considered. And so these algorithmic based models have that advantage, right? They can look at um, a much larger combination of information. The hope is that they're 
you know, cover all these three things that they are efficient, effective, and objective. And so, you know, there's a a lot of upbeat selling, I guess, you know, in uh, among those agencies. And and then there usually is an attempt, and then it sort of fails, and then the next country takes it on. I mean, that's sort of my observation of the European space, right? But I do think it is understandable uh, that these agencies uh, try to do this. And you know, help these job centers to prioritize, um, to, uh, as I said, uh, launch interventions to reduce long-term unemployment risk and uh, to uh, allow the limited resources be allocated to those people that really need it and can benefit from it. That's the effectiveness part, right? You don't want, I mean, there might be more need, but you don't have enough resources. Similarly, when it comes to job ads and first filtering, there's a good argument to be made that maybe these AI systems could do a better job because they are, they're not just looking at one very prominent visible indicator and uh, let their, um, their internal bias <laughs> let them carry away. And there has been an interesting uh, paper uh, uh, written last year or published from David Hangartner from ETH where they did show that at least for first screening opportunity, this kind of approach can, can help. In the health context, um, I heard many of you have met or interacted with or worked for Raid Dani at some point in time when he was here. I saw yesterday a uh, picture from a, a 2019 event. Um, he worked on, uh, was used to be at uh, University of Chicago, is now in Carnegie Mellon, and has uh, started this whole data for good uh, program that will, was mentioned um, a, a while ago, and various initiatives of that type, and they all have the same characteristics. There, there is a limited set of resources. You have to decide who gets supported, where is an intervention launched, and, uh, and you have some information on their likelihood to drop out of a program or to be incarcerated or something like that. And, and in those kind of se settings, the hope is that if you use the data well that you have, you can improve what's currently done, right? And that's, that's an, I think, an important piece to keep in mind. It's always relative to the current benchmark, right? And if you are, I mean, just imagine that that is actually not that high of a bar because if, if you say, like, okay, right now we have people that make bad decisions, bias, right? And now if a system that comes in that makes still a bad decision and bias, but it's faster, that is an improvement in a way for the system, right? I mean, it's not, we would like to do better, right? We would like to, you know, be, the risk then or the worry is of course when the bad decisions scale up and the thing goes under control. But you know, for the moment, a little bit of benefit of the doubt. And I think the same is true for, for these um, AI uh, uh, applications in the justice system and, and even the social scoring that gets increasingly debated and right now we point fingers at countries that employ that but soon I'm sure we will see this in many other countries that there are versions of this out there, right? That whatever traces you leave, you know, are not just determining whether you get a credit, but also whether you are admitted to an online game or whether you, you know, there are all kinds of decisions where you try to keep the bad people out and the good people in. And, um, and here too, you know, the, the initial attempts are good, right? Efficiency, more, or reduce subjectivity and effectiveness, um, but but the question is, can can we actually achieve these goals? Right. And in order to do that, I want to re-emphasize something that um, Jack said this morning. That it really deep, like having these goals in mind. The next step for us is like who decides what these goals are and how we get there, right? And what which role do we as data scientists play in that? And you know, if you if you think about it, it's like at the macro level, we have sort of a vision on what should happen in society. We want to move from you know square state to the. But what we really need to look at is like what happens in the machinery below. What is at the micro level going on with the data, and um, and and of course the the literature on AI fairness and applications in that space is filled with examples where, where you can easily point to things go wrong, right? So there, there's a radio station in Germany that did a little thing on job talk interview video clips that they, um, they ran through a, a personality classification system, the big five. You can practice your German. 
uh, the, these are the, the you know openness and conscientiousness and extraversion. Um, many of you might know these categories. And um, but anyway, this is a psychology, a, a pretty well known way to classify people into sort of five basic uh, psychological traits. And uh, the blue line is the original line. The yellow line is the line with the same video, only difference is that there's a picture in the back, right? And, and so they have a, f a whole piece on how like little alterations of the background can entirely change what the AI system would read out of these videos. Not surprising to anyone here, I would think, because you all learned that it can be little things. And in fact, we have seen this morning a couple of talks where we know, you know, the d different pieces of information in an image um, can be um, part of what was learned to be then something completely different, and that's that's the case here, of course, as well. But you know, how does that happen, right? And so I think for us it is important that we, you know, think about that. It's not just about that pi pipeline. You know, you have a set of input data, you have your analysis, and then you 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 talk about the output that you have. But at each of these, there are people involved that make decisions. Those that provide their data into the input stream or decide not to, those that decide to use certain features or not and to augment them in a way or not, and then obviously uh, what we do with these information and predictions matters too. Um, I think someone cited this paper this morning as well, you know, coming out of that CMU group, um, I believe. Um, The example on credit scoring on what happens when you um, include marital status and race in, I think it was in your presentation, right, that you talked about the uh, inclusion of these features um, or not. Um, and, you know, displayed here the effect on various models, right, and interaction effects. So the, the difference in acceptance rate for credit scoring between males and females, depending on what you decide to include in the model. Well, who is making that decision? That's all of you, right? Depending on what we decide to put in, the difference between two groups can vary a lot, right? And the thing is, you know, if you work in a company, but also when you work in academia, there's always a lot of time pressure. You know, you want to get the publication out, you know, you have to launch your product and whatnot. How many times do you go through all the possible ways and look at this and, and the effects of every single decision that you make, you know? And this is a decision on model building, maybe more so there because that's what you're trained at. But what about the decisions up front, how you categorize the variables, you know, whether you lump three categories together, how you impute the missing data. I mean, there are a lot of decisions on the way. And we have um, used data in, uh, from that labor market context. I have, don't have the slides with me, but um, and sort of played around at each step where a decision was made, you know, looked, uh, made different decisions and looked at the downstream's effect on these predictions later on, who, where should the intervention be. And the range is gigantic, you know. I mean, they, they do, that does matter. And, and I think while we are used to sensitivity analysis, I don't think that we often really do that for all of the decisions that we make in this process, right? And let alone that we have sufficient transparency on all the decisions someone else makes. You know, I mean, we talk about explainability and the difficulty of great transparency for the AI algorithm itself, but what about the transparency of <laughs> like the, the process before when you prepare the data and when you, you know, um, decide what, uh, what data to use in the first place. Now, Deciding on what counts, you know, and what decision should be made is also a decision. And um, we we heard earlier, and I want to dwell on that a little bit, that that these various fairness metrics that the AI community came up with, you know, that I mean they're beautiful, but they have an inherent problem with them, right? You can't you can't satisfy that for everybody at once, right? And 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 unless everything is completely equal for all groups, you will have unfairness. I mean, that's sort of, and uh, Rick Burke said that so nicely, you know, of the lessons that can be taken, perhaps the most important for policy is that when there's a lack of separation between these groups, meaning, you know, there's a different base rates across group categories, a QE trade-off will be the false positive and false negative rates. 
on one hand and conditional use um, accuracy equality on the other, right? That, that you, you can't optimize for all of it. Right? That it just doesn't work. So you have to make a decision. And we went into ethics a little bit earlier and, and you can think of this, um, you know, in, in what is the justice principle that we are trying to apply here, you know? And one is would be fairness, you know, everyone getting the same, but um, you know, if, if here's an example, right? You could say it's like, well, in in the principle of equality, you know, I, m I might want an equality of treatment, everyone getting the same treatment, everyone getting the same intervention, right? Um, and in the um, in the in the in the uh, job setting, you know, that could be that I just have a lottery and that uh, helps me to uh, select uh, who gets um, put into, in, in, into the position or into the program. But you could switch this around and say, I want equality of outcome, right? I, I, I need to have different treatments for different groups because I want at the end everybody to be the same. Totally different principle. Same with, um, you know, the principle of um, desert, you know, well it's, subforms of, you know, productive contribution, effort, and cost and sacrifice. You know, all of these are ethical concepts on who should get help. Well, maybe the person should get he most help who contributed most to the system ahead of time, right? That would be a fairness principle that I if I talk about it for another five minutes, you might buy into and say, yeah, that's what we should be doing, right? I mean, someone who, like, brought in a lot of effort ahead of time um, should, should be uh, treated differentially. It could be needs uh, assessed, right? That you said those that need the help the most, you know, should get the access. So there is a lot, there are a lot of decisions to be made. What should be the principle we apply here? And it sounds so easy to say we should be fair, but what does fairness mean? And this clearly, and you know, I was glad to have the opportunity to, 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 to flesh this out a little bit, what we heard this morning or earlier today, that, that that what fairness really means of what we're wanting to achieve is a societal decision. Right? You, you won't be able to make that, but you as a data scientist have to ask this question, like what should I optimize for, right? What is the principle that we are trying, what, what is it that we are trying to achieve? Because once it's automated, once you scale, right, you have to make sure that you can have a defendable decision because then it applies to so many people, right? If it's an individual, well, you know, we talked about that earlier, it's inefficient, right? You might affect, you know, 10 people in, in a month and not a thousand, you know? And so, and, and plus then it's the same principle across all, right? So, so we really have to decide that is the principle that we want to enforce, you know? And, and if that is a decision, I love that example with the, uh, with the um, recordings in the um, fitting rooms, uh, for the double pun here, because privacy, of course, is also a data science topic, and we'll come to that in a moment. But, but uh, this sort of agreement and in and, and these fairness issues, I think I I I don't know if we can get there, you know, because there are inherent conflicting interests, you know, and worldviews, and and so in mon some contexts, you just as a company or organization have to say, like, well, this is what we want, you know. But then, you know, ideally you can write it down on paper, you know, or in your algorithm and comment. It's like, we decide it, you know. Um, but then the also the question, of course, is um, how is that perceived what you decide, you know? And we, we ran a few experiments uh, just lately, and I thought I'd bring that with you, uh, just, you know, for kicks, uh, sort of, does it matter to the person who is the, at the receiving end of these decisions? how the decision came about, what data went in there, who made the decision, in which context the decision is made. And we, so we ran a study in Germany with a few, what we call even yet experiments, where we give people a scenario and then we systematically vary pieces of information. So the colored pieces of information here in that text um, were things that we varied experimentally. So some people would see a setting where it's about uh, the local unemployment agency doing something. Someone else would say like the, the credit agency does something. Um, we varied whether it's assistive or punitive. We varied whether the, where the information about the person came from and whether it was the em employee making the decision or uh, an AI system. And um, I spare you the data collection detail 
although that, of course, defeats my whole point on telling you it's important to look at the data. But I'm happy to send you <laughs> papers for the details. But the point I want to show here is like in these various contexts, the first two rows um, in dark purple, that's the banking, the middle rows are uh, job decisions, and uh, the last one um, being training programs for the unemployed, right? And each of the columns is um, sort of who's involved in the decision making, the algorithm, both human and the algorithm, or just the human. And within each of the context area, it's whether the decision that was made is punitive or assistive. And then the, the, the different bars here, that's the scale that the respondents answered on, uh, varying from not at all fair to very fair. Right? And, you know, trained eyes as you guys, you can see that there is a clear difference here. And surprisingly to us, you know, when you run this through statistical models that actually look for, uh, you know, um, differences and whatnot, it is, the, the, the banking context stands out as one where the combination of human and algorithm is preferred over the human itself. Not true for the others, where still sort of the human is the preferred agent, you know? And um, these kind of inaction, I mean, I am of course asking myself, is like, okay, is that just because we're used to it now with the credit scoring? And will we get used to these other systems being in that way? Or do we recognize what we just heard in the financial markets context that with that amount of data, you know, these agents, they just make better decisions, you know? So that um, would be the next step. <laughs> so the last element, you know, on sort of who decides what counts, you know, is the, what counts in, in terms of what data do I put into my training set in the, to the beginning. An illustration of, uh, you know, diversity or the lack thereof in, in Google search strings over the, um, you know, in, in for, for several years, you know, I had fun typing university professor as a search term into Google image search. Right? And um, it was actually enlightening to hear earlier that they are trying to be diverse and you can see that here. These images are diverse, right? I mean, there's age variety and uh, racial variety and, and um, you know, maybe height and weight, and I mean, there are a couple of other things. It seems to be that the dominant thing, though, that unifies them all is having a black font behind you. <laughs> Some scribblings. I wonder if the algorithm was optimized for that. But anyway, it wasn't. I wasn't finding the diversity that I was looking for, right? And um, and then someone made a decision that changed this from one day to another. I happened to present this at a conference in July of 2019. I took that screenshot when I prepared the slides. And then I gave the presentation and someone said from the audience, like, wait a second, that hasn't at all happened when I do it. And then I looked at it and was like, you're right, you know? And so in those couple of days in between, whatever sits behind it was changed, right? And then I later on spoke to uh, the woman who led that uh, program at, at Google to, you know, increase diversity in another dimension when these search results come out. But what was interesting in that conversation with her was that they really struggled, you know, how should we do this? And then, you know, what, how should the representation be? I mean, here it's almost, you know, 50-50. That's also not an image of the world, right? I mean, it would be nice if 50% of the professors are female, but uh, and maybe that is the case in the US by now, but certainly not in Germany, you know, and, and probably many other countries, not either. But then there are even tougher questions, right? So she was discussing with me, like, you know, we are trying to talk to social scientists and like, what are the characteristics we should even look for? You know, I mean, gender is easy, right? That's the example we always use because that's so easy, right? But what about diverse as a third category, right? By now, administrative forms have that. Most algorithms can't act on it because the historic training data don't have that label, that third label long enough, right? But you know, and then in the images, how would that look like, right? And and what is then the next currently unlabeled, unobserved category that we might care about, right? So this is an, a constant process and one where, you know, someone has to make a decision. We want to pay attention to this now, you know? And, and it is a conversation that I think you will be the people to steer that conversation in the, the organization that you work at because there's too much trust in the data will tell us, you know, of those people who are involved in that process. 
And this is in a way, you know, for for those of us working with data, this has always been a problem, right? No matter the data source, whether this is coming from your social media data, whether this is coming old fashioned, you know, a questionnaire. Michigan is famous for its uh, survey research center and the ICPSR. The, uh, I, th the data archive that they have, you know, lots of survey data there. And the question is always like, who is not in the data, right? Who, whom are we missing with whatever system we're putting in place? Right now, we all love web surveys and we love the IoT devices that we, you know, carry on or not. But we, you know, new technology, we know there are probably a few people missing, right? Older technology, we think, well, everyone has that, right? And it's easy to overlook, you know, we, last night we were talking about broadband access and, and you know, how they're, Population is body, so not everyone will leave the traces in the way that we hope, and we often don't know who is missing. Right? And so the, the question really then on us is to decide how, how are we dealing with that problem of, of, of people that we don't have. And, you know, here your creativity is asked for. There are the solutions aren't out there yet, and there's constantly new ideas on how we could deal with that problem. Um, I guess I, I didn't bring the details uh, of this when I went to, I, I could tell you the story without the slides. I, I realized that I, I don't have the update here. But um, one of the new suggestions, for example, is a nature paper that came out last year and um, saying that, well, why don't we use the humans as social censors? Right? So when we do a survey, you know, we can ask, whom do you vote for, right? Or what's the likelihood you will vote for candidate X? Or we can ask you, well, among the people that you spoke with last week, you know, your close social circle, what percentage of people will vote for, right? Hopefully phrased a little better because percentages is something people can't really deal with, but you get the idea, right? Turns out that actually does work. You know, election predictions in the trump Hillary, um election that use that had a higher chance or were better in predicting uh, the outcomes. We use these techniques in uh, a COVID surveillance survey that we ran for the last two years. Some of you might have seen an invitation on Facebook on top of your news feed. Thank you for answering that survey. There, one of the questions was, you know, whether you have these symptoms and whether you know someone in your community who has the symptoms. And so why does that work and why is that helpful for filling in the gaps? Well, we know a population or sampling frame of Facebook users is biased. Not everyone is on Facebook, right? But the reasons you are not on Facebook are likely independent of your probability to get COVID. So, you know, it could still work as a prediction. Plus, certainly independent of anything that you observe as a trend. So in our case, we sampled data daily. We got the recordings daily. And to see the development, where are the next hotspots and whatnot, that quick development is independent of the Facebook user base because that stays stable, right? And um, what we saw then later on as hospital data, hospitalization data or testing data came around is that this added information of the COVID-like illnesses in the community really was adding signal above and beyond what the people reported about themselves because now you have you know, a human as social sensor, right? Okay, creative idea. You know, we were glad to be inspired, you know, by this suggestion and tried it out and it did work. And uh, it might not be a solution for many, many other situations. I'm just bringing this as an example that, that uh, you know, there's creativity needed, you know, to deal with this in particular um, when uh, we, um, when we face new data sources, um, this is the way we are asked uh, the question about the community. Do you personally know anyone in your local community who is sick with the fever and either a cough or difficulty breathing? Right? And, and so what was interesting in particular, I mean, in the US, the data sources are good. But if you look at, um, again, glancing, I'm aware that this is not uh, super visible. But here's the, the graph showing these results for each of the countries, um, starting with Spain here and all the way down to Tanzania. The black um, patterns are the benchmark cases from testing um, data that were, you know, official reports later on, showing the development of the pandemic and in color uh, the, um, uh, the the various models using 
um, the, the test positive signal that people reported themselves, the signal about their own symptoms, and the COVID-like signals uh, from the period of May to December in 2020, right? And, and you see they have sort of a, you know, this, the survey has sort of a, a week to 10 day lead time, you know, just serving as an early warning system, which is, was the original attempt uh, when, when the WHO and, and others approached Facebook if they could collect data that way. So, um, you know, when, when we look at what's happening, you know, ideas like the one I just showed, but also others, um, when, when, you know, discussion that we also seen in the last year was uh, that of an opposite trend. Let's use less data or let's, you know, you know, maybe not put the data out as precise. The US Census Bureau was at the forefront of a development that um, that pushed that we use differential privacy, a noise addition to the census data before it gets put out. And they have often led, you know, development in, in, in the privacy notion. With maybe the problem that some of these methods aren't necessarily the right methods for a certain data set, you know. So here too, context matter. Um, if your safety precautions, you know, it's like if I go hiking, you know, my safety precautions for my shoes are hiking boots, right? But if I go, you know, to the North Sea and walk around there, these hiking boots, you know, they will soak full with water and they're not useful. And so in that sense, I need a different set of protection, right? This, and, and this is unfortunately something that, you know, again, you know, like one tool, one metric for fairness, one, you know, data that can solve everything one privacy protection, the hope that will solve everything. And, and this nimbleness, you know, to decide what is useful in a certain context so that I don't end up creating more problems than I solved, I think is something that you need to embrace, you know. And for the Census Bureau, I mean, if for those of you who are following this discussion closely, there have been now lawsuits against the Census Bureau, the um, state of Alabama and, and, you know, several minority groups. They're very concerned about DP being used because you know, what are you doing with that? You're masking outliers, you're masking small groups. Well, if funding decisions are made to help small groups, then you might feel you could have gotten different amounts, would you be better visible in the data? Right? Since we can't see the data, it's hard to even look at that, you know, and people struggle to see how much is the difference really and how different was it before, you know, compared to what, again, is the question, but, um, but, but, but I think it is a good example that, that, you know, weighing these relative risks might be very important and, and something you need to learn. And, um, you know, some of you might know uh, Helen Nissenbaum's work on privacy in context, I think it's very well um, thought through a framework, either in this book or elsewhere, we have seen how quickly that can change public perception on which data can and should be used and should be shared. Um, I so happen to have a student who in 2019 did one of these kind of vignette experiments that I mentioned earlier, um, asking about willingness of people to share their health records to, uh, uh, actually not health records, their like um, digital data, like phone data, whatnot, to help combat a pandemic. He made that up in 2019, you know, he did not make up COVID, but it was beautiful for him. Then next year, you know, there was an external shock and we could repeat the study and see what, how, how have the preferences changed. So pure coincidence, but sometimes research works that way. And what you see here is this, the, the big shift in not acceptable to use the health data for that purpose, all in a sudden it being okay, right? So needs change people's interest in privacy. This is a, a, a fluid field, if you will, right? But what is not fluid is that, that the underlying principle, which is according to a societal norm, to a context where it makes sense, you know? All of a sudden it makes sense to use these data that way. And, and, and people are susceptible to what makes sense. Yeah. All right, well, if you do wanna, uh, be able to do this in a more uh, nimble way, if you will, you know, not use the, the same protection methods all the time. It does help to have environments in which you um, 
can see raw data, and I, uh, since Jin uh, mentioned the Coleridge Initiative, I thought I at least talk briefly about what that is. We created uh, a few years ago an, an, a cloud environment space in which confidential microdata from government agencies can reside and uh, be analyzed. People who work in it need to sign data use agreements. Pe data that flows out have to be checked for um, export control and, and sort of possible data leakage threats. But that environment and this approach to bring the data into the environment and then work with the agencies to solve problems they have by training their own people together with students, you know, and work on a project that helps them was a way uh, to unlock the data of, you know, by uh, now far over for those 40 agencies um, that we started out with. And, um, and I was reminded of what you said David, earlier, right? It is, it, it doesn't help if you come up with the problem. It's like, let's do that, right? You have to work with these organizations and do something they would do anyway and then just, you know, assist a little in, in making that better, right? And, and that's, that's the approach that we used and, and, and worked. And, and, you know, um, just to close this out, uh, another in the tradition of these uh, National Academy reports, there has been a recent report released, you know, on, um, uh, you know, the need for transparency of all these processes, you know, no matter which environment you work at. And I, I do want to point out why I think this is so important, you know, tying the bow here to, uh, to the various examples. In the past, when we had survey data or experiments that were not very complex in their data structure, right, all the work and all the decisions happened up front when you decide what to collect and how to do the design, and that's written up in papers and there's transparency. And then the analysis is pretty easy, right? You do your t-test, you can look in a textbook how t-test works, and then, you know, you look at the code and it's all clear. But with these other data streams, you know, to the point of all the decisions we need to make, not at all. The, the, the processing afterwards, the 10% fun, the ML work, plus the 90% of maybe not so fun, or actually I think it is fun <laughs> to prepare the data uh, in the proper way, but those are the decisions that really need to be transparent uh, to get a handle on these problems. So in summary, the data we produce, you know, are increasingly uh, used for training these AI systems, also in the social sciences or government space great potential, and, um, but I do think that it is important that we all really know how these data generating processes work, who participated in it, who didn't, whom are we missing uh, as we create these training sets, and, um, and hopefully we can count on your creative um, juices to come up with solutions to overcome some of these problems on uh, missing data nets, having the wrong labels, making the right decision, at least pointing out that we have to have these conversations. So thanks again. So uh, at this point, I'd like to ask the speakers to come up front and we'll, we didn't have any questions uh, right after the talk. And this is a joint period for questions for all of us in our panel discussion. Give, give me a minute, let, let them sit down and settle in. And <coughs> All right, go ahead. So I think this is actually a question to the rest of you, just in terms of context. I had this optimistic view that on things on which we can develop a societal consensus of right and wrong, 
that everything else would follow in terms of regulations and, and laws and good behavior and so on. And the question is, what about things on which we can't form a societal consensus? Maybe I start since I brought us back to that topic. So I, I, we have a lot of things where we don't have consensus, but we still have laws and policies, right? I mean, it, consensus doesn't necessarily mean everyone agrees. I mean, if everyone agrees, then it happens automatically, right? Then, then it's like the, the camera in the uh, dressing room, right? A lot, some topics will not be of that kind and never will be, right? But then we have, at least in a democracy, we have sort of procedures in place where we go through and then at the end is like, okay, given the procedures we have in place, this is what we're currently doing. And that was what, was what I meant earlier when, you know, imagine you work in a company or in a government agency and there is no law that says, right, then, then you as the community have to have that process and decide this is what we're gonna do and then communicate what that is that you do, right? The, the worst is if, if this sort of happens unexpectedly and you violate an implicit norm that was there, right? I mean, many of the privacy scandals we have seen in the past with the tech companies, it was this mismatch of the, the implicit norm that people thought, well, my data sits just here and isn't used for anything else, and then it is, you know, that kind of mismatch. So you can look at so you can look at some real cases and, and you will see how democracy functions. So closest to me, for example, is gerrymandering issue. And and you know in last decade or so one party really took advantage of it. Some of them went to court, right? But not all states. Or this time the other party tried to compensate, right? So the d advantage the first party had built up over last decade is kind of compensated by the other party over doing it. Right? So there are areas where that's how the political process works. Right? But at least in a democracy, there are processes. So over there, the key thing I would say is at least the transparency. There should be disclosure, right? More disclosure there is, more awareness will build. And, and then, you know, people will try to do other actions, some of which are adversarial. But, but things will, the pendulum will swing back and forth and hopefully come to a better place.
Yeah, well, uh, so I, I but, can keep. Sure, and and I sure, um, and and also uh, thank you for introducing yourself. And I'd like to ask questioners to introduce themselves, um, just just so you know. I think I think it, it just makes for a better conversation. Uh, the question was: many many decisions that are being made are really important, and, and algorithmic decisions. And these algorithms uh, should preferably be in the control of the public and not uh, private corporations that are beholden to their shareholders. So on the point about uh, the, the good versus evil framing, uh, it's really a practical point that that is, I think, generally not a good way to advance debate. Because once you start getting into the underlying motivations or the morality or the you know, will or you know, of, of, a, of a party to the debate, you've lost any ability to really in, in engage the questions uh, of interest. Uh, I think you know where we are as uh, scientists is we're responsible for helping everyone understand what are the implications of technology, what are especially the unanticipated uh, conditions, help people navigate uh, through very um, uh, nuanced and complicated questions where people think they understand what fairness means or equity means or whatever, but then there's all kinds of subtleties and trade-offs that we didn't really realize that have to be uh, worked through. So once you start you know, bringing it into you know, good guys and bad guys conversation, it's, it's really almost impossible. I think we also have to recognize you know, a little bit of humility that um, you know, I'm a professor. Nobody elected me to select social policy. I hope I have you know, some, some uh, information and a uh, voice that could be um, informative you know, for that and, you know, and, and maybe you know, can influence it. But ultimately, there's a political process that, will, that, that should and properly does uh, handle that. Whether it does it effectively, again, is not um, you know, a matter for, of, for us to be able to control. Uh, and we can just try to provide the best information for that uh, democratic process to work out. So, so I would like to you know, contest your statement that corporates only report to shareholders. You know, if you study that field, it is an aberration. It started in 1980s. John Friedman and company pushed that, and you know he won a debate in 80s to do that. But if and but that pendulum is already swinging back. Just a few years ago, CEOs of I'd say 50 big companies signed a letter, and saying that they don't think that's appropriate. There are five stakeholders in a company, right? You have customers, you have employees, you have shareholders, you know, and you have a few others, like society is a stakeholder. And if you look at the long history of corporations, they were responsible equally to all five. Go back to 60s and check that. So that aberration 40 year, what happened on Wall Street, the pendulum is already swinging back. Okay, in many countries, they have put social, corporate social responsibility, a very formalized thing. If you go to Midwest, right where you are, for example, in Minnesota, with almost 18 or 20 Fortune 500 headquarters, uh, they take it very seriously. You know, Target will donate 5% of their profit to the to the charitable causes locally. So we shouldn't, you know. But but again, the key thing is to find common ground. There are sensible people on both sides, and in a well-administered place, all three sides come together and they talk. They find a way to find a common ground. Okay. So we should not, you know, again, if you label somebody really bad, it's very hard to have a conversation with them, right? I mean, this is the important point. But, you know, corporations, you know, government, civil society, there are three different parts. In a good society, you need all three, and you need to find a common ground. Oftentimes, the civil society kind of becomes very aggressive and takes the stand that you are advocating. But I think it's very, very counterproductive. That's what I'll say. Yeah, yeah I just, I, I'd like to add, I th I'm glad you raised the point, and I think it's one worth, uh, or the, the good and bad, but to the point about making these algorithms available, accessible to the public, I think it's good to deliberate this whole notion of is there good and bad, like keep the conversation going. We don't have to make a conclusion here. I would. I, I. I. really like what you s stated about the five stakeholders, and I would would agree with that. Um, your question makes me start to go down the path. Well, wait. 
does, if these algorithms are affecting us in potentially in con uh, consequential negative ways and we want access um, and then, hmm, should drug companies be forced to put their formulas into the public domain because they help us? Should, you know, it starts getting like this. So again, I don't know the answer, but I think it's, it's very com 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 complex. Because part of me would say, um, the company developed this. This is, they created it. And, you know, Amazon would be a good case to me of I choose to use, use AWS. I think it's a, I'm sorry, uh, Amazon. In many ways, I can't stand their practices, but I've made a decision that the convenience, the value as a customer, it offers me, I will continue to do it. Facebook, another story, totally got rid of my account years ago. <laughs> but um, I guess all I wanted to say, I'm glad you raised the question. I don't think it's an easy one to answer, but I th think that um, we should keep having the conversation. Yeah, I think I think uh, we're we're probably going a little bit uh, beyond beyond the scope of of our discussion here. Uh, the, there's the, the the fundamentals of you know the capitalist system and Adam Smith and all of this is that the vaccines might not have been there in the first place if we didn't have enough incentives for innovation. And how to balance that is is something that. I don't think we should we should be debating here. So I'd like to move on to the next comment. <laughs> Hello, my name is Alina Barnett. I'm visiting from Duke University. I have a question about we've had lots of discussion about all these interesting topics about responsible machine learning. And one thing that's repeatedly come up is that in machine learning, there's a lot of focus on methodology in the current literature. And now those papers are most cited. And if you don't have you know, a solid methodology paper, it can be hard to get future positions. So what I was asking is, because we're interested all in this topic and we'd like to advance it in the scientific discourse, what can we do now and in the future to make the topics about responsible machine learning more prevalent and you know easier to publish on and make a career out of compared to methodology papers. So I, I'm not sure if this is working, but um, I think that uh, thank you. Yeah. Um, I think that there's there's always a risk with these kind of things, right? But if you for yourself will will be best in publishing the topics that really vex you, right? And so if you write papers that compare methodologies and you love that topic, it will be a good paper, right? And you will have a very niche um career profile, you know, I started out doing survey methodology. There might be three people in this room and only because it's Michigan who have heard that term. Um, but that doesn't mean you can't find position. You won't have hundreds of them at your disposal. But when there are positions that look for these kind of people, then it's, then you will be there. So I wouldn't be too worried to have a specialized career path, you know. A bigger issue is, can you find the right outlet, right? And there are increasingly, and some were mentioned earlier, the Fed conferences or, you know, the, in, the, in, the, in the community, there are increasingly conferences that are a bit more interdisciplinary or a bit more on 
you know, the, the, the methods evaluation. My, my reading of the field as a bit of an outsider compared to some of the others here is that that is on the upswing. There will be more of that because many more of the boundary disciplines that work with data need these kind of papers. They won't be the ones studying the methodology. They have to pick one and they need the literature and the papers and the people who, 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 decide, who, who evaluate and give them guidance. Right? So, so maybe you're a little ahead of time if you feel like now you can't find the outlet, but this, there, there will be a lot of demand for that kind of thing down the road. I, at least that's my impression. I was just going to say one of the publications you you have that you shared would be to me is an outlet. If you're trying to say the the methodology theoretical papers versus perhaps applied and into just right. So um, I really applaud Harvard when they came up with the Harvard Data Science Review. It's an open source publication. I would say it has a very loose review process. It's not this highly rigorous peer review process. And it, it, in part, was to recognize there is important information to be shared into, about interdisciplinary data science and other things. So I, I do think, as you're saying, there are starting to be venues that are recognizing the, the value, and they may be some to consider. That's my impression as well, that there's actually uh, a very strong demand and hunger for anyone who's got great ideas about how to pursue all of these questions uh, responsibly. Uh, it's not just, again, about um, you know, uh, pounding the table about the need for responsibility, but actually constructive um, uh, approaches that are, are, and practice that, that, that promotes this is something that everybody wants to do. Everybody actually is afraid of, um, of uh, being called out for not being responsible in various ways and would love to have new uh, techniques and infrastructure and, and so on that, that, um, that it helps people f uh, feel confident that they, uh, that they are uh, performing this way. But there, but there is an, um, what do you want to call it? There is an underlying problem. For many of you who are going to seek um, position as an academia, tenure track, now we have a problem, right? Because we still have departments at certain universities that are do have a narrow view of where you publish, what kind of paper you publish. And I'm glad to see there are some universities that are, you know, doing fairly bold things in their promotion and tenure processes to eliminate some of that and make some of this other publication work valued. Let me add kind of a couple of things. So first, uh, you know, um, evaluating people, CRA has, you know, shared a memo. I think that these two were there, you know, best practice for evaluating younger faculty members and so on. And one thing they really discourage is quantitative numbers, like number of papers, right? Or num but instead they focus on impact. And, you know, number of citations is one measure of impact, but there are other measures. If you solve a societal problem, like Raid Bani we were talking about, right? I don't know how many citations he had, but everybody talks about AI for good because he was the first one to start that, right? And this brings me to a second advice I got in Berkeley as a graduate student. My advisor, C.V. Ramamurthy, always told us, it's very hard to see far on a crowded beach. So that if everybody is changing methodology, you don't want to be changing it. Think of from economics perspective, you understand demand and supply. In a crowded field, the supply exceeds the demand. But there are fields where there is demand and there is no supply. And I will give you an example from your own community. Right now, climate is a big priority. How many computer scientists are involved in climate research? How many of you are involved in climate research? Raise your hand. One. <laughs> there, is a, there is a graduate student in CMU he actually edited a paper on machine learning for climate change, which has 20 co-authors, all the big name of in the field, Turing Award winners are co-authors. Does anyone know the name of that girl? <laughs> Good. So you can think about her. I don't know how many citations she has or not, but she stood out. And you know, in CRA, we are inviting her to a panel. Every department has to be there. You can imagine they would not be looking at her citations, huh? 
So look for the need. Chase the demand, not the supply. This is the foolish thing French traders do. And by the way, in stock market, these high frequency traders, they don't make much money. Right? <laughs> look at Warren Buffett's challenge. You know, he challenged all these you know, traders and he gave a million dollar award saying, beat me over 10 years. This award money is still sitting there. So don't chase the trend unless you can lead the trend. Start in interest. Look for demand. Look for what government wants. Look for what businesses want. If government, business, academia, all three want one thing, that has led. Okay? Doesn't matter how many citations you see, you know that you have. So that's the way I will approach it. And responsible computing is broader than what you see in pattern of that. Climate is part of that. Environment is part of that. And that's where we don't have the support. So step forward. Thanks. I basically asked myself as a climate scientist. <laughs> I'm Douglas Rao from NC State University, and I also graduated from Maryland. So, so I'm really excited to see you. And my question is that some, uh, some people may argue that the fairness or unfairness caused by the asymmetry of information when some decisions are made, when either it's because of algorithms or because of the um, institution who are making decisions have more information than the individuals who are affected by that, either as applicants or um, other different type of applications. So from, as a community, how either, how can we move towards a way that to affect practice and also using the research, trying to address those unfairness or the um, inequity caused by those asymmetry of information? I actually think that this is happening right now uh, already. Uh, you know, in any, in any technology, there's sort of an initial adoption and one realizes all kinds of shortcomings and works to address them. And this is, this is a continuing process. The kind of discussions that we are having here and the work that many people in this room have, have been doing is stuff that is having impact and is being adopted into real products and systems and processes. So, so I, I'm not. I don't think that that the system is broken. This is this is a normal system. That actually is a good question. So, uh, uh, I I'm going to see if anybody on the panel has things of. How can, what, what steps can we take to get faster adoption and greater attention paid to some of the fairness and, and other such responsible deployment issues? Correct me if I'm wrong, but I, I, I took your question as in, like, change that inequity of information, right? So that the transparency on, what is done, which data is used, and, and so on. I do think that um, there too, you know, what Jack said is certainly true, a lot is happening. I mean, when when we all started out, there was no such thing as GitHub and code repositories and, and uh, the open data movement and, you know, I mean, they, it does take time, right? Because, you, you know, the, 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 many of these is sort of generational shifts. So then now the question is, acceleration, you know, how can we do that faster? I do think we all are responsible as we, you know, as educators to make sure this is part of the demand, that, that this is part, like you said, this has to be part of every class. It has to be second nature, and it is probably to all of you, right? But it has to be second nature across the board, not just with the future leaders, but for everyone, you know? And and so, so that there is at least, you know, in. On, on the decisions that I was talking about, you know, transparency in the record of what decision was made. You know, that's the first step to um, to help with that inequality of information. Go ahead.
Uh, so I don't think anyone uh, here or has the power to slow it down. Uh, you know, I, I think we can certainly uh, uh, raise awareness of uh, dangers and actually work on uh, ways that, that mitigate the, the dangers. But the, you know, the, if you talk about the proliferation of AI, the economic forces are enormous and well beyond, you know, um, I think you know academia uh, to to really have much uh, effect on. I think uh, the the question that I raised before about how can we make regulation move faster to try to uh, uh, keep up. I think that is the you know the, the only hope. And no, in, in some areas, I'm optimistic about it. You you mentioned you know cars and seatbelts, but I think also cars for an autonomous driving is li is likely to be an area where regulation will move fast enough just because there's major auto companies that, you know, that have big stakes in, in getting all that, that kind of stuff worked out. In other areas uh, that are maybe more in the data science area, there is no centralizing entity that can control very much, and, and, and it's uh, uh, a little bit more concerning. But you know, regulators just even, know, even need to know what to do, what they could do. Um, and uh, the, th the things that we do just to sensitize don't actually give the answer to, OK, then what actually is the regulation? If the regulation is stop technology, I'm afraid that, that's one that's going to be a non-starter. It's going to be how to channel it in a, in a, in a you know, potentially less harmful direction. Hey, I'm Samantha Chu from the Social Data Science at the University of Maryland. And I just, I feel like there's a conundrum kind of going on in this, this room with the graduate students and with the presenters here. And I'm going to symbolically give it through what I saw with data science, right? Data science, we all came from a field where it was like cost analysts, operations research analysts, historians, that if you did and worked with data, you became a data scientist. And now you've brought together a room full of graduate students and we come from a very disjointed field with presentations on both ends across the spectrum. And we were asked, okay, let's think about responsible AI. And so I'm thinking, I feel stuck here, right? Like in data science, I'm still trying to build trust in the community to believe in the data that I'm presenting them and to make decisions. And now I feel like I'm taking this huge step forward and I also think maybe we should be slowing down and I'm thinking, am I trying to figure out how to convince people to be responsible with AI in my field to trust AI and I mean, I'm barely there with data science now and is AI going to now be as disjointed as data science or splinter off into different sections? Like how do we take that step forward. We had a conversation um, Farouka and I had a conversation yesterday about you're saying data science and AI. I think w my view, we're treating AI like it's this this thing, this separate thing from data science. To me, data science, AI is a advanced method of using data science methods and tools and techniques. So I don't think if you're still saying, I'm still trying to figure out data science, I don't think you, you have to say, oh, and then there's this AI thing. Um, there are these Venn diagrams and it really depends on who draws them. Like if you're trying to see how AI, machine learning, data science relate. Some people put the big circle as data science and the other two inside. I believe that's right. I believe that we have this field of data science. We have this great mechanism, machine learning, that can create AI systems. That's kind of my simple view of it. Um, so what am I saying? I'm saying don't worry too much. <laughs> I think I'm saying don't worry too much that I, I don't think like anyone has figured out the, the whole Field. I mentioned earlier, there are only four, what, maybe five universities in the country that even thought, well, data science is such a thing that we're actually going to create an academic unit about it. Lots of degrees are out there, right? So it's still um, evolving. I do want to say one thing about the, the back to the AI. I do, I, I, I would like to see not necessarily slow down, but definitely more regulation. 
like if if we're introducing these sophisticated AI algorithms to the financial market, I back to the cyber discussion I tried to initiate, I think the government should be pretty involved personally in making sure we're not opening up new holes for attack and so on. I, that to me is an important conversation. So maybe I'll try to give you a very broad audience answer because it appears you know, you're coming from a discipline a bit different from AI and machine learning. So in AI, you can think of it as two layers. In fact, there is a DARPA video you may like to watch. You know? So there is a, you can say, more core fundamental layer, where that's where machine learning sits. And that is something you may want to compare with statistics and data mining, these three things. right? And you will find some similarities and some differences. Relative, if you know statistics very well, then you know that you know there were statistical methods 100 years ago which were difficult to use because you didn't have compute power, right? You had to do it by hand, like Monte Carlo method. But with uh, growth in computing power, today you can use them. Right? Many spatial statistical methods had the same issue. Likelihood, you know, minimization by hand is hard. But today we have compute power to do it, right? So what does machine learning add to that? Because statisticians can use GPUs and supercomputers. Right? So they have brought in some new representations. Because in statistics, you know, you had probability theory, you were using functions and more mathematical you know, data, right? But in AI, you can have computational representations, such as decision trees, such as deep neural networks, right? And now we have enough data and compute power to start to train them, even to parameter estimation reasonably well. And ideally, these machine learning methods actually do use statistical models for confidence testing. Those of us who drop that for computational efficiency are, are playing with you know, very risky games. Right? Uh, so this is you know, the level where you can connect very easily. But there is a separate level of AI, and the best way to think about that is data types. Because in statistics, we were very focused on numbers. Right? Everything has to reduce to numbers. But in AI, because we want to mimic human you know, language recognition, human vision, human speech recognition. They have played a lot with other data types like imagery, video. And, you know, and they have found that these new machine learning techniques like deep neural networks can do a reasonable job of object detection, like vehicle simple one. And this is an area where you can start playing with new data types, which statistics, um, I mean, there were pattern recognition and skew things, but certainly AI has added an extra step to that. Right? So that's kind of the way to think about it. You can play with more data types, you can play with more representations, and you know more data and more computing, and, and that's the way I will put it together. So there are unifying things, and, and people would bring it together. If you read good books on data science, they will bring all this together. In fact, the CSEM article picture that Keith was showing, you did put AI inside one of these uh, modeling box, right? And that's what you put together. So that's the way to think about it. Th things you know, people equally, equally find them. So we are at the last minute, last question. So I think that, you know, we navigate life assuming that most things stay the same. You know, that in terms of sort of, you put, you put an object on a table, you go away, you come back after 10 minutes, you expect it to be there. If it's not there, you notice it, it's an event, right? Um, and I think that the time scales at which a lot of learning happens is short enough that this is not, a, not an issue. 
to me, when we are using learning methods for things with long time scales, uh, where we know that things are changing, this is just fundamentally a problem. You've got to build a more sophisticated model. You cannot just begin with your standard. I've got training data. I've figured something out, and I'm going to work with it. Um, and and so, you know, for instance, when Praga showed these things in three different domains, it, it was no surprise to me that in the banking domain, the algorithms worked a lot better than in the employment domain. You know, the time scales of the employment domain make it very hard for, for algorithms to work right. Yeah, I, I think that, um, I mean, I'm excited to see uh, recent papers on dealing with sort of the issue of distributional shifts, right? And and uh, we happy to, you know, <laughs> nerd out on those uh, tomorrow with you. But um, so I think there is some method development going on where the focus shifts a little bit from looking at the entire distribution that rather than looking if the relationships we are after hold for all possible subgroups, right? And, and I think that, that can be an important development, but more important what Jack said is like, no matter what we do, to have a, an eye on shifts in the past, because that too is something you can look at, right? And you can see like how quickly are shifts happening in historic data, right? And, and so maybe as you train your data, you know, you, 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 you treat that differently. You, you weight more heavily, more recent data and, and things like that. So I think that, that with that awareness, you will likely develop the creativity for the next solution. So in some domains, you have additional knowledge, right? Particularly in physical domains. Think of climate change. Clearly, things are non-stationary, right? And you have very nicely pinpointed that out-of-sample prediction is a big Achilles heel of AI, machine learning, statistics, data mining, data science, right? So, but in some domains, you have these theories, you have knowledge that you can use to actually extrapolate out-of-sample. You know, so in physical sciences, you know, you know calculus, right? Calculus is a language of change. There are differential equation models of many physical phenomena, including atmospheric science, which is what helped us predict global warming 50 years ahead, right? So do you know stochastic differential equations? You know, that brings statistics and physical science together, right? So there are methods. You can bring data-driven things and process-driven things together, right? In fact, when we were saying who is missing, right, the example you gave, she's using social science theory to fill in the gap. Right, homophily or whatever you want to call it, right? So actually there is a whole workshop, you know, the two, three years, Vipin is running this physics-guided machine learning, process-guided machine learning. So there are a number of people working on it, you know, to basically out-of-sample out prediction is the biggest, you know, what is the theoretical question right now. If I could just say, I, I don't necessarily have any, um, you know, positive constructive answer to this, but I think it's really great to raise this point, you know, and I think it's actually not the exception, but rather, it's always the case that a model trained from data to be used in some decision context, that decision context will be different than the environment in which the, the training data was created. And so, you know, sometimes um, uh, data science is raised that, you know, because it's based on data, it's more real than some other kind of modeling approach that was ever. But, you know, th there's, there's always going to be assumptions, you know, like this, that, that, and it's part of responsible data science to be, to have the truth in advertising about you know, those assumptions. And I think, you know, another thing that happens when things go wrong is they say, oh, well, of course they just used the wrong data and it was, you know, but of course that is, since that's always going to be the case, it's, it's a matter of degree that we have to, you know, understand is, is you know, is something that cannot be 100% corrected for. So with that, uh, we're a couple of minutes over time. Thank you all. Um, and um, 